afternoon. I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order of the House Equitable Justice System and Law Enforcement Reform Committee. Uh, during these unprecedented times that we face, not only in this state, but all over this globe, the task we have before us today, uh, although many consider daunting, is extremely important. Uh, it's important for equality and justice for all South Carolinians. Uh, it's important for us to take the time to meet, to hear from experts, to make sure that in everything we stand for in South Carolina, that is it inclusive for the people uh, who call South Carolina home. I'm going to introduce uh, the panel, and you can see the panel is large, and that's on purpose. Uh, this panel that I'm going to introduce to you today comprises nearly 15% of the House of Representatives, and it is strictly bipartisan. While po politics plays a part in our, wor our world today and in what we do in our worldview, it certainly should not play a part in us moving forward and making sure uh, that in everything we do in South Carolina is for all. With that, I'd like to introduce Shannon Erickson, Chandra Dillard, Ivory Thigpen, Chris Wooten, Cesar McKnight, Tommy Pope, Gary Smith, Will Wheeler, Beth Bernstein, Wendell Gilliard, Max Hyde, Weston Newton, Chris Hart, Mandy Kimmons, Chris Murphy, and Leon Stavernakis. As you can hear from those names, they represent differing parts of South Carolina, both geographically and demographically. All those things are certainly important as we move into the task that we have today. I am certainly glad to join with Todd Rutherford, who is the minority leader in the House of Representatives. Uh, we have had an excellent working relationship. And if you look at the issues that we have faced in South Carolina over the last decade under the leadership of Speaker Lucas, we have taken the approach to be inclusive and forthright in all of those issues. This one is none different. With that, Mr. Rutherford, thank you for being here and thank you for co-chairing. Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair Simrel, and uh, thank you to Speaker Lucas for putting this together. Uh, as soon as we saw the unrest going on around the country, uh, Speaker Lucas and I spoke and he decided that this was the best way to approach it by putting together this committee, bipartisan, uh, people from all over the state to try and figure out what we could do better in South Carolina. And hopefully we're going to do that through substantive change, putting forth bills that will make a difference not only to the people, but also to law enforcement, to make law enforcement better, to make everyone accountable for the laws that we pass up here and for our expectations as to how this state should run. So again, thank you, Chairman Simmel. Thank you, thank you to all of you who took the time to come during this pandemic. And to most of you in the audience, thank you all for coming as well and your, your participation. And uh, you know, I look forward to being here, to serving to listening, to hearing what everyone has to say, and hopefully having some good come out of this. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. For our first meeting today, uh, we're going to hear uh, from four uh, different experts in their fields. Uh, I would like to, to ask at this point that we refrain from questions during uh, the presentations. The first presentation will be done uh, via screen and Skype. So. After that presentation uh, has occurred, we will have an opportunity for questions to come from members uh, of, the, of the panel. Um, I think as we move through this, one of the things that, that we'll see is that the best way to uh, accomplish goals uh, is to break down what those goals are, and we will see that forthcoming. And so as we break out into uh, subcommittees to make sure we're looking at all aspects of how to bring about reform in South Carolina, uh, it is important that we keep that in mind. Uh, first, um, Professor Andrea Dennis, Associate Dean for Faculty Development, and John Bird Martin, Chair of Law from the University of Georgia. Uh, her bio is included. Uh, at this time, we certainly would welcome uh, Professor Dennis, Dean Dennis, to the program. Dean Dennis. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Let me begin by thanking Speaker Jay Lucas and his press secretary, Nicolette Walters, for inviting me to speak with you today regarding the committee's extremely important work. 
Thank you. I am delighted to be here, even though I'm not there actually in person. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge my esteemed co-presenters, solicitors Stone and Gibson and Professor Stoughton, their varied background experiences and perspectives and South Carolina specific knowledge will be invaluable to the committee. I look forward to hearing their remarks. In the time I have, I will touch base on each of the four core issue areas identified by Speaker Lucas in his charge to the committee. My remarks are not meant to be comprehensive. Indeed, that would be impossible. There are many sub issues that this committee can and should at least discuss if not actually tackle, but time prevents me just from discussing them all. As a consequence, my goal is to provide you with a high level overview of just a handful of sub issues that are or have received significant attention and flag other avenues for the committee to explore as it undertakes its work. One last caveat before I proceed, the following are my opinions and they do not necessarily represent those of the University of Georgia School of Law. The first core area that the committee will be examining concerns law enforcement officer training, tactics, standards, and accountability. On this subject, I offer thoughts on two matters for your consideration, police training requirements and law enforcement accountability. A third topic that has received significant attention in the last few months is the use of neck restraint techniques. A fourth topic that has received much attention in the last handful of years is the wearing of body cameras by officers. I suspect some of you are quite familiar with both or one of these issues and recent legislative efforts in South Carolina. In the interest of time, I will not focus remarks on those topics, though I am happy to discuss them during Q&A. Training requirements. Before officially being hired as a law enforcement officer in South Carolina, all candidates for the job are expected to train at and receive their certification from the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy. Requirements for appointment as an officer include completion of the Academy's training program, a high school diploma or equivalent education, completion of the physical test administered by the Academy, background checks, evidence of good character, and evidence that the candidate is at least 21 years old. By statute, South Carolina also mandates continuing education requirements for most law enforcement officers, requiring them to earn 40 continuing education credits every three years when their certification is up for renewal. As well, most officers must earn credits in domestic violence education and in mental health or addictive disorders education to renew their certification. These training and certification requirements are in line with common approaches. However, there are some possible avenues of reform that have recently been suggested. For example, increasing the amount of required continuing education credits. Making continuing education credits requirements annual rather than over a period of three years. And mandating additional specific topics for both initial training and continuing education. Possible specific topics include non-escalation, de-escalation, alternatives to neck restraint techniques, implicit or unconscious bias, interacting with youth, and officer stress reduction, mental well-being, and self-care. All of these training areas and professional education topics may help to reduce police use of force generally, but also in relation to over-police and vulnerable populations. Accountability. Police accountability for misconduct and violence can take many forms, including civil liability, criminal prosecution, and citizen review. Let me say a little bit about each. When an individual believes he or she has experienced some form of police misconduct or violence, that individual is entitled to file a civil suit against individual officers and government agencies seeking damages for harm suffered. Assuming that an officer's conduct exceeded legal bounds, which is not a given, the legal doctrine of qualified immunity often prevents an individual from recovering damages. The modern day doctrine of qualified immunity was created by judges and designed to shield police and other government officials from frivolous lawsuits regarding their professional conduct. The doctrine allows officers, quote, breathing room, unquote, to make split second decisions in the field without fear of financial repercussions. 
as a result of the doctrine, cases, even those involving extreme misconduct, may be dismissed if there is no prior decision that would have given the officer involved notice the actions were prohibited under law. To many, this outcome is unsupportable and illegitimate. It is argued that if officers and government agencies routinely avoid financial responsibility for their impermissible or extreme conduct, then there is little incentive to change behavior. Hence, of late, there has been a call and organized effort to revisit the doctrine of qualified immunity in the courts. There are justices of the U.S. Supreme Court willing to revisit the doctrine, and currently before the court are multiple pending cases involving qualified immunity. Nonetheless, the doctrine remains in place. Despite its perceived benefits, the continuance of the doctrine poses a significant barrier to government accountability for police misconduct and violence, particularly when coupled with the lack of successful criminal prosecution of law enforcement officers who engage in undesirable behavior. While the committee may not see fit in the end to legislatively eliminate or modify the doctrine of qualified immunity, it is an important area worth exploring because study will reveal, excuse me, will reveal the depth of the problem of police misconduct and violence. In addition to individual civil liability, officers may be held individually responsible for their behavior by facing criminal charges. However, various police excuse me, policies and procedures impede the likelihood of criminal charges being filed against officers. The few cases of late that have resulted in criminal prosecution are not the norm. Here in South Carolina, one particular investigative concern is that South Carolina investigators of police shootings and likely also lesser crimes hold officers to a different standard than ordinary citizens suspected of engaging in criminal activity. According to news reports, the state law enforcement division routinely waited two or more days before interviewing officers after a shooting, while members of the public are typically immediately questioned. The passage of time allows for degradation of memory and fabrication. Additionally, according to news reports, officers typically are allowed to provide investigators handwritten statements rather than face interrogation like ordinary citizens. As officers well know, interrogation produces different information from an individual than when the individual is simply asked to, quote, write down what happened, unquote. Finally, reports reveal that police officers are able to justify the use of deadly force by reciting boilerplate language that they, quote, feared for their lives, unquote. According to criminologists and legal scholars, this type of broad-based, generic, yet legally sufficient language can hide abuse and prevent officers from facing responsibility. In terms of the prosecutorial role in policing law enforcement officers, it is not uncommon for a local prosecutor to review a deadly police shooting case or a case concerning other behavior. However, nationally in the last few years, there has been a call for independent prosecutors to review police involved cases to avoid the appearance that a local prosecutor is biased in favor of a local officer. Various strategies have been adopted, including referring the case to a local prosecutor from another jurisdiction, referring the case to a state attorney general, and referring the case to a federal prosecutor. It is not uncommon for referral decisions to be made when necessary or as needed, rather than for there to be a standard approach. As a matter of consistency, transparency, legitimacy, and ultimately accountability, this committee may adopt the view that a statewide approach to investigation and prosecution of police misconduct and equal treatment of officers and citizens is preferable to the current system. A third layer of police accountability is citizen or civilian input, review, or oversight. Variously called review boards, advisory boards, or commissions, Citizen input is not a novel concept. It has existed in some form in jurisdictions nationwide since at least the 1950s, with the practice burgeoning in the 1990s. Here in South Carolina, citizen advisory boards or councils have been created in some localities, while other jurisdictions are unwilling to create them. Citizen input does not come in a one-size-fits-all model. Board approaches vary widely in terms of the scope of oversight, the membership's composition, the structure and level of staffing, the level of funding, the procedures, and the scope of authority. Citizen oversight, too, is not without its troubles and limitations. 
For example, the United States Department of Justice has articulated three points of concern. First, oversight procedures in some jurisdictions have exacerbated tensions between local officials, police and sheriff's departments and unions, and citizen groups and activists. Second, citizen oversight itself cannot ensure police accountability. Jurisdictions need to implement other internal and external mechanisms alongside citizen input to systematically achieve the goal of accountability. Third and finally, complainants who use one of these citizen review systems may be frustrated, disappointed, or unsatisfied, whether due to long delays between filing a complaint and resolution of the complaint, or losing a case, or regardless of the outcome of the case. No matter what form it takes, and despite the possible pit pitfalls, citizen input offers an additional level of accountability for the conduct of officers, decreases numbers of civil suits, strengthens community relations, increases police trust and legitimacy among citizens, and provides valuable policy and procedure recommendations. For these reasons, communities should consider implementing a system that fits the needs of the particular jurisdiction. A state-level law indicating support for citizen input and establishing parameters can advance implementation. The second core area the speaker has asked the committee to look at is civil asset forfeiture reform. In the last few years, South Carolina lawmakers have expended significant energy on the reform of civil asset forfeiture. During the 2019-20 term, a bipartisan reform bill was introduced to abolish civil forfeiture and replace it with criminal forfeiture, which, unlike civil forfeiture, requires a conviction in order for assets to be seized. The bill also redirected forfeiture proceeds to the general fund, strengthened due process safeguards for defendants, and restored the presumption of innocence to defendants in forfeiture cases. However, the bill has not been enacted. Legislatively banning the practice of civil forfeiture funds finds support in a recent South Carolina circuit court case in which a judge ruled that civil asset forfeiture in South Carolina is unconstitutional, a violation of the Fourth, Fifth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendments. Although that is one lower court judge's ruling, the decision is instructive in that it highlighted the issues with civil forfeiture, including how law enforcement is incentivized to seize assets for local benefit, the racial and socioeconomic bias present in forfeiture enforcement, and the lack of actual opportunity for innocent victims of forfeiture to regain ownership of their seized assets. Legislation eliminating civil asset forfeiture will do much to reduce the detrimental impacts of civil forfeiture on individuals and families, but it is not a panacea. Banning civil forfeiture altogether or replacing it with criminal forfeiture does not enact a ban on federal civil forfeiture, which still allows law enforcement agencies to be rewarded for forfeiture under the United States Department of Justice's equitable sharing program. Further, some local law enforcement agencies have claimed that a state's ban on civil forfeiture does not apply to them due to municipal ordinances permitting forfeiture. It's important to keep in mind that many of the critiques that apply to civil forfeiture equally apply to criminal forfeiture. For example, African Americans and low income individuals are disproportionately subject to and negatively affected by criminal forfeiture. Owners often lack counsel in criminal forfeiture cases. There is no right to a court appointed attorney in forfeiture proceedings. So a court appointed lawyer likely will not handle an asset forfeiture case. Many owners lack funds to hire an attorney, and for many attorneys, the case is not worth the time and effort. As well, many of the same or similar procedural hurdles exist in criminal forfeiture cases as civil forfeiture cases, notwithstanding the connection to an actual criminal case and conviction. Nevertheless, should the committee consider abolishing civil forfeiture, doing so would have a large and positive impact on citizens and moving toward a system relying solely on criminal forfeiture would create some improvements for defendants. The third and core topic area for the committee's consideration is criminal process and procedure reform. In this area, I would like to talk about two issues, no-knock warrants and bail reform, though there may be other issues that the committee would like to discuss, and I'm happy to do so. 
No-knock warrants. The no-knock warrant is a product of the war on drugs coming into use in the 1980s as a culture of militarization swept over law enforcement. A no-knock warrant is a search warrant authorizing police officers to enter certain premises without knocking and announcing their presence or purpose prior to entering the premises. Such warrants are issued when entry pursuant to the knock and announce rule, meaning that officers must announce themselves prior to entry of a premises, would lead to the destruction of contraband or evidence. No-knock warrants have come under scrutiny nationwide following the death in March 2020 of Breonna Taylor, who was fatally shot in her home at night in Louisville, Kentucky, by police officers who had secured a no-knock warrant. Ms. Taylor's killing during the execution of a no-knock warrant may be the most recent high-profile incident, but it is by far not the only instance. Other stories of injuries and fatalities suffered during the execution of a no-knock warrant can readily be found. The danger that exists from no-knock warrants is attributable in part to the nature of a no-knock warrant and its intersection with other criminal law legal doctrine. As mentioned, no-knock warrants allow police to force entry into a private home without announcing themselves. Yet the criminal law castle doctrine justifies a person within a home using deadly force in self-defense without retreating. On the ground, there is a natural tension between these two doctrines. When the rate of citizen gun ownership and possession within the home is factored in, the result is a dangerous mixture that creates an inherent risk of harm to citizens and police anytime police enter a home without notice. Just this month, the South Carolina Supreme Court recognized this danger, temporarily ordering lower court judges to stop issuing no-knock warrants. Enactment of a permanent statewide measure is a reform the committee may want to consider. Various approaches are possible, including legislative prohibition on judges issuing no-knock warrants, legislative requirements that traditional search warrants be executed during daylight hours, roughly defined as between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., legislation prohibiting quick knock or fast entry, and legislating that pursuant to state constitutional law, state judges should apply the exclusionary rule to evidence obtained through knock and announce violations. Turning to the issue of bail reform, in South Carolina, as in many other jurisdictions, a pretrial defendant has a right to a personal recognizance bond, meaning a cashless bond, if he or she does not pose a flight risk or danger to the community. Nonetheless, judges have broad discretion in determining whether to release an individual pending trial and what conditions to impose for release, including financial conditions. The result is that thousands of people are incarcerated pending trial and South Carolina local governments spend millions of dollars annually to house them. Many who are sitting in jail awaiting resolution of their case are black, poor, and unable to post the few hundred dollars required as a condition of release. This problem is additionally troubling because evidence indicates that men of color receive higher bail amounts than white men for the same offenses. The negative impacts of pretrial detention are well documented. People who are jailed pretrial often wait months and sometimes years for their cases to resolve, although they are constitutionally presumed innocent. In the meantime, they may lose their jobs, homes, children, and critical community ties. People who are jailed struggle to work with defense counsel to develop their cases, resulting in negative outcomes in comparison to those released pretrial. Evidence indicates that those who cannot afford bail are nearly four times more likely to receive a jail sentence that is up to three times longer than those who can afford bail and be released pending adjudication. Additionally, while incarcerated individuals are at risk of violence, the deterioration of their mental and physical health, and the infliction of lasting trauma. Finally, those awaiting a trial date in a detention center are more likely to plead guilty to an offense if only to pay a fine or serve their time so they can return to their jobs and family, notwithstanding the possibility that they are actually or factually innocent. One solution that many jurisdictions have considered and some have implemented is to eliminate cash bail or financial conditions of release. And in turn, these jurisdictions have released more defendants on recognizance or community supervision with conditions, non-financial conditions. 
data suggests that these individuals generally will show up to court proceedings and do not necessarily pose an additional danger to the community. So the issues of eliminating no knock or quick knock warrants and bail reform may be two that the committee wants to consider in the area of criminal procedure reform. The fourth and final core area the committee is, will examine is that of sentencing reform. I'm running short on time, so I want to say just a bit about sentence length reduction and community supervision. The cost to incarcerate a single individual eclipses that of the cost of other forms of sentencing, such as community supervision. Incarceration is also costly on an individual level for many of the same reasons I discussed with protect to pretrial detention. It may space abuse, healthcare problems, and emotional trauma while serving their sentences in custodial facilities, inmate separation from family and community, harms all those connected to the individual, whether emotionally or economically. For corrections officers, out overcrowded facilities pose dangers to their health and safety. And finally, incarceration undermines rehabilitation, which is vital given that most individuals convicted of crimes and sentenced to a period of incarceration will be released back into society after serving their sentence. Reducing the number of incarcerated individuals and shifting from a punitive sentencing approach that merely warehouses individuals to one that actually promotes rehabilitation will create positive benefits for individuals in society. Most incarcerated individuals are nonviolent offenders and a disproportionate number are men of color. Releasing them will address, although not eliminate, concerns of mass, mass incarceration and racial disproportionality. In 2018 and 19, South Carolina lawmakers made efforts to reduce the state's incarcerated population by proposing to eliminate all mandatory minimum sentences, provide the opportunity for individuals with lengthy sentences to petition the court for resentencing after serving at least 10 years, and allow automatic parole of nonviolent inmates who meet certain conditions. The legislation, however, has not been enacted. Lawmakers' efforts are consistent with national trends on reducing sentence length. One final point bears mentioning. Early release should ideally be coupled with community-based re-entry, supervision, and programming so that individuals are supported upon release and less likely to recidivate in the near and the long term. In closing, let me share that I have neither lived nor worked in South Carolina, but I have connections to the state that endow me with a reason to be invested in the success of the committee's reform work. I am fond of several current and former faculty members at South Carolina Law. While at Georgia Law, I have worked with students whose home state is South Carolina or who have attended college in South Carolina, and I have been impressed with their talent, smarts, and dedication. Finally, extended family members live in South Carolina. To that end, I hope my brief remarks have been informative and helpful, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dennis. Um, if you could stay with us, and we appreciate you doing that. Any questions of Professor Dennis? You, you are very thorough. Thank you, thank <laughs> thank you, you. Professor Dennis. Next, we have Duffy Stone, a solicitor from the 14th Circuit. Uh, Mr. Stone is serving his uh, fourth term uh, as solicitor. And Mr. Stone, we welcome you uh, to the podium today and appreciate your testimony as well. And uh, his bio, for those of you who do not know, is, in, is included in the packet. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Uh, Chairman Rutherford, uh, for inviting me, Mr. Speaker. Thank you as well. Um, I am um, a little intimidated following a law professor. Uh, Speaker Lucas and I actually went to law school together, and he will be the first to tell you that uh, I am not a law professor. So uh, if you've got any questions for the academic end of it, I think you just missed your opportunity. Uh, I hope, though, that what I can offer you today is a different perspective. 
Uh, when I graduated law school, I went directly into the courtroom and in criminal courtrooms around uh, South Carolina. Uh, I have spent most of my career as a prosecutor. Uh, I work both on the local as well as the national level with prosecutors, and this is something that uh, I, I take very seriously, and I hope that what I can offer you today is a perspective on what you've been seeing throughout this country um, from a perspective of somebody that um, is very concerned with the same things that you're seeing, uh, but from somebody that can see it from the standpoint of a prosecutor. Um, I look first at the George Floyd situation, and I also look at the Ahmaud Arbery situation, both of which we have weighed in on as local prosecutors as well as national prosecutors in situations that I don't have to spend much time telling you uh, are outrageous and horrible situations. Uh, I look at those, though, and I see other lessons that we can use here in South Carolina to, I believe, bring real reform in what we're doing and real justice to the system. Uh, if we look at first the George Floyd situation, uh, what we see in that, um, and from a prosecutor's standpoint, I will tell you that the district attorney there is a man named Mike Freeman. Uh, I know Mike. I've worked with him for years in the, in the uh, national level, and I will tell you that he is an outstanding prosecutor. He is a career prosecutor, and I had conversations with him when this was unfolding. What you see from Mr. Freeman is he brought criminal charges in this case in four days. Four days. It took him four days to gather all the information he could possibly gather and make a determination and then start trying to criminally charge these officers. Now, what is interesting about that is, were that in South Carolina, I assure you that four days would be lightning fast. I do not know of a single case in which I have dealt with in my career since 1989 that I have been able to make a decision one way or the other that fast, except in very rare instances, and I'll talk to you that, talk about that in just a few minutes. Four days was lightning fast for a prosecutor to make that decision. And make no mistake about this, when it comes to officer-involved shootings, when it comes to the death of a citizen, the person that everyone looks to to make that decision is a prosecutor whether it is me, whether it is another prosecutor, whether it's the attorney general, whether it is a federal prosecutor, it makes no difference. The prosecutor is going to be the one that the community says, tell us what you're going to do about this. This is the job that we sign up for, we recognize it, and we're prepared for it. But we need help in order to be able to do this, to, to answer those questions, because while Mike Freeman took four days, it was not quick enough. It was not quick enough. We don't have the luxury anymore of waiting several months to make a decision on these cases. We have to make them immediately. We have to make them correctly. We have to make them with every bit of information that we can get our hands on. And there's a way to do that, but not in the current situation that we're in South Carolina. Number one, my, one of my recommendations, and I, I did this as an op-ed piece. I also have some handouts that I'll give you in a few moments, but I want to just cover these and allow you for any questions you, but you may have. But number one, any police officer that is handed a gun in the state of South Carolina needs to be handed a camera. It's that simple. Body cameras need to be mandated. And they need to be mandated to anyone, and along with that, the training that goes along with it, and the policies and procedures of when you turn the camera on and when you turn it off, and who it's eligible for. And all of that is something that can be done and should be done. Body cameras on every police officer. Number two, that evidence that is created by those body cameras needs to go to prosecutors immediately. It doesn't need to be downloaded. It doesn't need to be copied. It doesn't need to be transferred or driven. It needs to be uploaded in an electronic format and sent to the prosecutor immediately. Why? Because the community demands that I answer that question immediately and not, I'll get back to you when I get the information from law enforcement. It needs to be immediate. My last officer-involved shooting took several months. They did not have body cameras. The SLED report, which SLED did an outstanding job on their investigation, was probably a foot thick, and it took a long time to go through. But we don't have that luxury. We need to get that information quickly, and it's possible. I have a jurisdiction in my circuit uh, named Hardyville, the town of Hardyville. It's not a particularly large jurisdiction. Uh, it's not a particularly wealthy one. But they have body cameras, and not only do they have body cameras, 
they have internet access, and they have uh, evidence storing capabilities. I received a call this time about two years ago from the chief at Hardyville, and like many of you have jurisdictions that are smaller law enforcement agencies, if there is an officer involved incident, the very first thing the chief or the sheriff does is he suspends those officers involved. If you're in a town like Hardyville and six people were involved in the case one way or the other, all six of those people are suspended. So the chief called me and said, basically, my entire law enforcement division is right now at, at the office. I can't do anything with them. But every one of them had body cameras, every one of them. And they had an evidence set up so that they could send that evidence to me immediately. It was about 6 o'clock on a Friday night. By about 10.30, I was able to call, that off, call the chief back and tell him, we're still going to do a SWAT investigation, but it, from, from watching every one of those camera, camera angles, what your officers did were, was proper. Body cameras will protect citizens, and they will protect police officers. They give us the entire scene, and there's no reason in today's world that that can't be mandated. And if we have a concern with technology, I know, Mr. Chairman, you had mentioned earlier, I think last week, about having making sure that we had broadband and Internet service provided throughout this state. Uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, I think that's a public safety issue as well as an education issue, and I'll be more than happy to, to do that because that is something that we should have. The evidence can be captured, it can be sent, and we can make those decisions at least the best that we can as quickly as, as possible. Independent investigations, I think at this point in time, I, I don't know that I need to belabor the point uh, behind an independent investigation. I think all investigations of officer-involved shootings have to be conducted by somebody other than the agency involved in hiring the officer. Now, we've already said that a number of times, and I know that a lot of people have discussed this, but there's a second element to that that hasn't been discussed, which is what about misconduct allegations that do not rise to the level of killing someone? What about misconduct that officers have that allows an officer to leave one jurisdiction and go to another and get hired and the other officer, the police chief there, doesn't know anything about it? What about the misconduct allegation that happens that that internal investigation determined not to be valid, therefore I as the prosecutor don't know anything about it? Two weeks ago I, two weeks ago, I found out that there was an unlawful use of force in one of my jurisdictions, an allegation by a citizen. I was fortunate enough to see the, uh, the body camera, and quite frankly, I think the officer, the, the officer did act properly. But I found out about it by looking at the newspaper. I didn't, look, I didn't find out about it because the sheriff of that particular jurisdiction sent it to me. We need, and this is a recommendation from the National District Attorneys Association as well, there needs to be a central repository for all information concerning misconduct on any officer, whether those are internal affairs investigations, disciplinary actions, or citizens' complaints concerning unlawful force or other things that affect their credibility. If you are a criminal defense attorney, you expect me as a solicitor to turn over to you any Brady material, any material that goes to their credibility. That's my responsibility. And if I have that information, I'm either going to turn it over to you or I'm going to turn it over to the judge, but I'm not going to risk losing my law license by hiding it. But I've got to get it first. And right now, there's no requirement for me to get it. Again, the use of force allegation two weeks ago, I found out about it by reading the newspaper. We already have a mechanism in place with the South Carolina Academy that holds information concerning decertification. But we go back to the independent concept in that. And we think that when it comes to officer-involved shootings, certainly we need independent investigation. But that, that, that uh, independent investigation is lacking in that material because those determinations are being made at the local level. In other words, if the sheriff or the chief doesn't feel like that is a valid complaint, it's not going to get sent to the academy, and therefore I'm not going to know anything about it. And therefore I'm not going to be able to give it to the defense attorney if that is, in, in fact, a situation. The other thing that I would like to add on that as well that I think is particularly relevant uh, having spoken to the district attorney in Minneapolis, I'll tell you that he had a very difficult time, and I think if you see the news, you will tell. Initially, they charged murder, I believe, in the second degree. Then they changed it to murder in the third degree, and it's gone back and forth. In South Carolina, that situation would be worse. Murder and voluntary manslaughter do not neatly fit when you're dealing with a law enforcement officer incident. There needs to be an unlawful use of force statute. Forty-one states in this country have it. 41. 
South Carolina does not. That standard would outline exactly what it is the officer can do and what they can't do. It would also include the standard that they have to abide by. They are, they are taught at the academy, Tennessee versus Garner. That is not necessarily what's going to be charged to the jury in a criminal case. So what's going to happen and what happens now in South Carolina is you try to take these square pegs of facts and cram them into the round hole of law and it doesn't fit. So your jury doesn't understand it and they get confused. And as a prosecutor, you go back and forth trying to decide, does this fit murder, does this fit manslaughter? An unlawful, un unnecessary use of force statute covers that. It also protects the police officer as well because it also uses that same standard that they're taught at the academy to use. Uh, and that's something that I think is a, a fairly straightforward uh, solution. When you look at the Ahmad Arbery case, this is also something that we weighed in at both the national level, uh, not the local level, but the national level. You see three people who ran somebody down for jogging through the street. And they ran them down, and they trapped them, and they murdered him. The defense at trial in that case will be the use of a citizen's arrest statute in the state of Georgia because they couldn't get it off the books quick enough. That's going to be the defense. And here's the scary part. That would be the defense in the state of South Carolina as well. We have two statutes that outline citizen's ar arrest rights. 17-13-10 uh, and 17-13-20, and they both need to be revoked. In our case, you can arrest somebody as a citizen for theft or a felony, any felony. And we handle a lot of felonies. And if it's at nighttime, the language of the statute, and I want to make sure I get this exactly right, is even if the life should be taken, our South Carolina state statute says you can kill somebody if they're breaking or plundering into a building or if they have stolen property on them. That's a statute that needs to be revoked. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is stuff that may, may not be, actually the, the speaker, and I was very attentive as well as the law professor, uh, to understand exactly what the parameters were, and I believe that this committee is going to cover a lot of different bases, and the, what I'm going to talk about now I know has been addressed in this General Assembly previously, um, some of which you may like, some of which you may not, but again, I tell you from my standpoint of seeing it uh, in the perspective that I see it. Um, I have a friend that is a district attorney in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, she was elected her first term and in Tennessee, they have eight-year terms. Uh, I will tell you that I would be more than happy if you would like to change the solicitor's term to eight years. Um, but she has an eight-year term, and she was elected. And on her election day, she received a letter from an inmate. And I know many of you have received letters from inmates. I receive them relatively routinely. They're not always the nicest letter I've ever gotten. But this one was kind of interesting. The letter that went to Amy Wyrick, the district attorney in Memphis, from an inmate in the Tennessee Department of Corrections said this, congratulations on your election. I have followed your race. And I want to tell you something from my perspective that nobody may have ever told you before. The people that are in prison that I deal with on a regular basis as fellow prisoners, there are, they, they generally deal with two different types of these people. There are people in here who struggle with antisocial behavior. And there are people in here that embrace it. And that is the first time that I, as a prosecutor, despite having done this for almost 30 years, have ever heard it summarized in such a way that it made a lot of sense to me. And we have to deal with both of those. And we recognize as prosecutors and people that have been in the criminal justices for a long time that there's a lot of truth to that that you have people that struggle with antisocial social behavior, and then you've got some that embrace it. And you have got to recognize both of them. And when we're talking about sentence reform, or we're talking about prison reform, or we're talking about a number of different issues, you have to look at both of those things if you actually want to accomplish real reform which benefits the system. And I will tell you that from a struggle standpoint, what we have in South Carolina are good things, and they're called treatment courts. We have drug courts. 
We have mental health courts. We have domestic violence courts. We have treatment courts for veterans who we've sent to foreign lands to fight for us that have come back and when they hear a book hit the ground, they think it's a shell. And they come back with mental health issues that they didn't go with while protecting our freedoms. And we have treatment programs for those. And those treatment programs work because of two things. Number one, they give and provide the treatment that these people need. And there's a lot of need out there. There's a lot of need out there. And the second thing they do is they hold them accountable to make sure they get that treatment. That's why drug courts work. That's why veterans court works. But they are underfunded in the state of South Carolina. I will tell you from the 14th Circuit standpoint, I have five counties. I have Buford, Jasper, Colleton, Hampton, and Allendale. Buford is one of the wealthiest counties in South Carolina. Allendale is second to the last, the poorest county in the state of South Carolina. Average poverty in South Carolina is 16.6%. Allendale is 36%. They cannot afford treatment courts. They can't afford anything. And it's not fair for me to treat one person who is struggling against alcohol or drug addiction in one county that's wealthy that can afford it, but I can't do that in these other counties. It cost me $188,000 to run a treatment program in Beaufort County. I've got, it, I've got it in both juvenile and adult courts because I don't think it's fair to spend all of your resources on 30-year-olds and not do something for the 15-year-olds. But once you get them in Buford County and you take a look at those numbers, $188,000 is what it costs me. The state of South Carolina through fines and fees provides 118 of that. 20,000 comes from program fees, which are actually paid for by the participants, leaving me a $50,000 gap. And that's provided by the town of Hilton Head, which by definition means I can't move it out of Buford County. We need to find treatment courts, not just the wealthy ones, but also, also for the poor areas of South Carolina, because there are a lot more counties that are closer in those poverty lines to Allendale than there are to Buford. We need treatment programs for those people. And here's the thing about it. I've been asked in both the Senate Finance as well as House Oversight the same question. What are we going to do about prison overcrowding? Your second highest entrance into the South Carolina Department of Corrections, your second category, are people that are there for dangerous drugs. That's your second highest population base going into the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Second. And that's just the people that are actually charged with drug crimes. That doesn't include, from an analysis standpoint, how many are there because of drugs, but they were not sent there on that particular charge. People who have committed robberies or rapes or other charges because of that. Drugs are a huge issue in our South Carolina for people that are going. If we put the money into these drug court programs and mental health court programs and out in the community, you will reduce the number of people in your prison and it will be a lot cheaper to do that, to fund them at the local level than it does at the Department of Corrections level. Um, the Second thing, though, and, and this is where I, I realize that I will probably uh, split from some of you, is I go back to this, what, what this inmate said and, and what I think is, is right. There are people who struggle with antisocial behavior, but there's also people who embrace it, and we have to recognize that, too. And when you look at sentence reform, you have to recognize that there is a population that, quite frankly, needs to go to prison. I, I, I talk about that because I've lived it, and I've lived it a number of times. Um, I feel very strongly about our drug court program, and I want that to work. I want to give everybody an opportunity. But there are people that I deal with that need to go to prison, and we have to treat those people seriously. If we don't, we're not giving a balance to the criminal justice system. And I'm going to talk to you very briefly, and I will close with this, uh, someone by the name of Tyrone Robinson. I prosecuted Tyrone Robinson several years ago, but Tyrone Robinson had been prosecuted a number of times before me. In fact, from 1994 until 2002, Tyrone Robinson committed 13 separate crimes. He had been in and out of prison pretty much his entire life. When he got out of prison, he would go back in. And it's important to recognize what those charges are because they all have something in common. 13 different crimes starting in 1994, malicious injury to property, assault and battery, disorderly conduct, burglary in the third degree, 
grand larceny, discharging a firearm, hit and run, assault and battery, domestic violence, two counts of that, two different instances of that, unlawful firearm, possession of a stolen motor vehicle, and failure to stop for a blue light. He was paroled four times. He violated parole three times. He, would have, he didn't violate the last one because his sentence ran out. At sentencing, and this to me is so crucial, I believe that we in South Carolina have a very good way of electing judges, and you do it. I think your choice for judges, the way you do it, I think is good, and I think it's one of the best ones in this country. We trust those people that we make judges to make decisions every day, and one of them when they're in criminal court is the person in front of you, or is that person somebody that is struggling or embracing? Are they dangerous? We ask our judges to make that decision every day. At sentencing for Tyrone Robinson for three charges, the sentencing judge, who was not known as a heavy senator, looked up after hearing the trial, after hearing from law enforcement, after hearing from the defendant, said, you are dangerous, and you're what make our town dangerous, and you're what make our county dangerous, and I'm going to give you every day I can. And he did. He maxed out all three of those offenses, and then gave them consecutive time, which we very rarely see in the criminal court system. He clearly knew he was dealing with a dangerous person. Um, he served seven years of a 13-year sentence, and then he shot and killed the kid that's on the monitor. His name is Khalil Singleton. He was eight years old. He was committing the crime of jumping on a trampoline in his aunt's yard. Eight years old. And he was killed by somebody who got out of prison after serving only seven of the 13 year sentence, despite the fact that everybody knew he was dangerous. But he got out because all of those crimes that I listed, they all have something in common. We call them nonviolent. Every one of them, the burglary, the domestic violence, the assault, all of those. And what do we do? We don't take them seriously. When you go to the South Carolina Department of Corrections on a nonviolent offense, no one looks at the history no one looks and says, is this person dangerous? We are asking a parole board to make a decision far removed from the courtroom to whether or not somebody is dangerous. And here's the interesting. I went to this vigil, and I talked to that community, and the community asked me, why was Tyrone Robinson out of prison? We all know he's dangerous. He was being chased. This was a shootout, and he was being chased by two other members of the community who... When Robinson went over to their house and shot at them, they didn't call law enforcement because they didn't trust that the state of South Carolina would fix their problem. They chased him, and they chased him into the neighborhood, and Robinson shot him back and killed his child. He was dangerous, and everybody knew it. The community knew it. The judge at sentencing knew it. Who didn't know it? The state of South Carolina didn't know it because... We're not going to that extra trouble to look and figure out, are these people that we're dealing with, are they struggling or are they embracing? Because I assure you, Tyrone Robinson was embracing, and everybody in the state of South Carolina, except for the state of South Carolina, knew it. I will tell you that I do not believe, I think if we fund drug courts, if we, drug, if we fund treatment courts, if we start recognizing that the people we're dealing with, some of them struggle, and we put the resources into that that we need to, I think we'll reduce the number of people that are actually going into our prisons. But when they go into the prison, they all need to serve 85% of their sentence, period. Everybody. They don't need to be designated violent or nonviolent because I assure you there may be violent or nonviolent crimes, but there are not specialized criminals going into the Department of Corrections. If you look at the mass number, what you're going to see are people who have either committed horrible crimes or they are repeat offenders that are going in over and over and over again. And the question is, does that work? Won't that create mass incarceration? And the answer is no. Yes, it will work, and no, it won't create mass incarceration. How do I know that? Because it already works. There are cases, there are charges, there are sentences now in which defendants have to serve 85%. And if you look at your Department of Corrections statistics, what you will see is by almost 10 percentage points, those people are less likely than anybody else in the South Carolina Department of Corrections to reoffend. 
I'll make sure that I've said that and make sure everybody understands it. If you've got a truth and sentencing sentence in South Carolina in the Department of Corrections and you get out, you are more, you are less likely to commit another crime and get back in prison by almost 10 percentage points of anybody else that serves a sentence there. You know who the most likely is? Nonviolent offenders, which if you think about it, it makes sense because the nonviolent offenders are not the ones that we're treating seriously. We're calling them nonviolent, we're saying, and we're sending the message, it's just not that serious. And that's just not true. 85% senators by our own Department of Correction records show that, number one. Number two, 17 states have what they're called as determinate sentencing. 17 states. 10 of those have lower incarceration rates than South Carolina. So if the concept is we can't do that because we'll, we'll create mass incarceration, it hasn't anywhere else. We have got, of those 17 states, 10 of them have less incarceration numbers than we do. And by the way, if you're thinking, well, if they've got to serve 85%, they're going to actually have to serve these horrible sentences. No wonder they're in there until they're 100 years old. That would make a good argument, but that's not true either. The average sentence for a truth and sentencer is 9.6 years, which means they're serving 8.16 years. They're not serving horribly long sentences. But when they serve them, they get out, they go on community service, uh, community supervision, and they don't go back. That, that's how we need to be treating all of these people. Um, and then my final suggestion along with that is also, I think, what the law professor touched on, which is you've got a parole board, an internment sentence uh, situation, you don't need a parole board. But having a reentry board is a different issue. And, and to be able to repurpose a parole board for somebody to start working with prisoners while they're in the Department of Corrections to ensure that they're taking advantage of those opportunities in prison, whether it's drug treatment, whether it's education components, makes no difference. Work, vocational rehabilitation, all of those things that allow them to be successful when they get out. And all of that needs to work, start working while they're in the South Carolina Department of Corrections and not wait until they get out. And that's something that I, I would suggest as well uh, on that. Um, I will tell you this, that, and I'll close with this. Thank you, first of all, for listening. I recognize that some of this, to me, I, I think when you look at reform, you have to think in terms of making the system better. And I don't think that's just one component. I don't think you can look at just one component or, I, or you can just affect one component. It all works together. And if you're going to make this system better, if you're going to make it fair, if you're going to make it more just, you're going to have to take all of those things into consideration. And, and otherwise, we're going to have to continue to have not only Tyrone Robinsons, we're also going to continue to have Khalil Singletons. And, and I, I don't want that anymore. I'm tired of it. Um, thank you very much. I've handed out, or I've asked them to hand out some of the, some of the materials that I have that I cited. In those materials also are some uh, proposed legislation, which I do not at all indicate to you that I know how to write legislation. So if, if you look at it and there's some changes, or I'll be glad to answer any questions. But thank you very much for, for listening to me, and I'll be more than happy to answer anything you have. Thank, thank you. you, Ms. Dunning. And there are some questions. Uh, Mr. McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon to the members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon to everyone present. And uh, in particular, good afternoon to you, some Solicitor Stone. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for your handout. Um, thank you for your candor in this matter. Um, I see that you're very passionate about this. I also see that you are well informed, and, and I appreciate the wealth of information that you've just provided uh, to us. Um, if you notice, my head was bobbing up and down pretty much the whole time. Um, my question really wants to deal with the I believe the gentleman's name is Tyrone Robinson. Yes, sir. And, and I appreciate your recommendation for uh, the 85 percent. But and, and I'm not at all pushing back against that. But do you think that one of the solutions that could have been for Tyrone Robinson is partic in particular is for a judge to retain jurisdiction over him? Um, one of the things we have a circuit system here in South Carolina and it works well. Um, you get to see different judges, different perspectives. But I think had a judge seen him more than once or more than twice, it would have gone off in one of the judges' uh, heads that, hey, this is a guy that I really need to send away for a long time. Do you think that maybe a judge retaining jurisdiction would have helped that matter? I, you know, I do. I think that I, I really, truly think that judges are in better positions to predict, predict future dangerousness than 
uh, even a parole board down the line. I, and I've gone to parole boards before. I've gone to families to parole boards. And um, I do believe that a judge, in, especially on the bench, hearing from everyone has a better opportunity to see that. So yes, I, I don't have, I don't know exactly how that would work as far as the mechanism, but, uh, but I certainly am open to that suggestion. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bernstein. Um, it might be too hard for me to get my mask on, so I'll take it off. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Solicitor Duffy, how are you today? Uh, thank thank you. you so much. I agree with Representative um, McKnight's um, characterization of your presentation because um, I don't practice criminal law. My brother does, and so some of these issues I'm not as familiar with, but I... I can recognize the importance of those. Um, something that you did not address but is in your material and something that is very important to me and something that I've advocated for and I think several members of this committee have advocated for is hate crimes legislation. And a, what you have is a sentence enhancement, which I call it a penalty enhancement, which is a, effectively the same thing. I've discussed this with some colleagues and colleagues over in the Senate, and I'm going to call them out on this. Um, particularly Senator Hembury, who was a former prosecutor, has, um, who is not, unless something has changed, but um, he's been on television saying this as well, but he's also said in private conversations, that he feels that this type of statute is not necessary, and it's my understanding at least my local police um, officers here are in favor of it, our Sheriff Leon Lott is, and our um, police chief here in the city of Columbia is, but Henry, Senator Henry has indicated that he doesn't feel that it's necessary because if someone is going to commit a crime, they're going to be penalized for that crime of, let's say, um, assault and battery. Um, and I tried to emphasize to him the importance of saying, well, it's accompanied by hate and bigotry, and it, there should be an enhancement to that penalty. Do you have an opinion on that without, you know, kind of throwing them under the bus here? But um, he, is a, he, he was someone who formerly was a prosecutor, and a lot of the people who are in law enforcement would um, appreciate to have a statute on the books like this. So I, I, I'm real interested to hear your comments and that's on that. Thank Greg you. Greg Hembury, is that his name? Yes, okay. yes. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course you know him. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't help it. I'm very sorry. Um, actually, uh, Senator Hembury um, and I were actually uh, uh, prosecutors together in 1989 or whenever. But yes. Um, and I would, I would tell you that I do understand some concerns about it, but I think I, let me just tell you from my perspective, uh, without necessarily uh, uh, taking issue one way or the other, but let me tell you, first of all, I knew that this was something that you and a number of members of, uh, of this committee had discussed before. I also kind of felt like it might be able to come up, so let me go ahead and do some research. Let me tell you what my concern was, and I think what that statute that I had recommended is actually taken from what you introduced last year, but with, with a little bit of a change in it. And let me just go through that if I could. Um, I think that uh, there are two ways of doing this. And if you look throughout the country, there are really two ways of doing it that, that I've seen it done in other countries, uh, in other states. It is either, the, it is a substantive crime in which it has an element that you have to prove, or it is a sentence enhancement. And the particularly difficult part of that is if you don't take that sentence enhancement and treat it differently, then you've got a problem with the underlying offense. So let me, let me back up and just kind of tell you from a prosecutor's standpoint. Having prosecuted, I, I'm not sure exactly how many cases, uh, I will tell you that I routinely have to prove who did it. I routinely have to prove uh, where they did it. And sometimes I know why they did it. But that is a very difficult component. Uh, however... What I've recommended in there is a bifurcated proceeding, much like we do our death penalty cases, which is the first, the underlying crime, whether it's murder, whether it's robbery, whether it's assault, we try that first. Then we go back to the jury, and we have the jury make the decision, much like we do in our death penalty case, whether or not hate was the motivating, motivating factor behind it. So here's what happens with that. If you do it that way, then you don't run the risk 
of trying to overreach and prove something that you can't prove on the, on the guilt phase of it and lose the entire offense. And I will tell you, that's what frightens prosecutors more. I, I would much rather be very conservative with the, those charges. It may be a situation that I have evidence of that, but I don't want that to be, I don't want a, a defendant to basically sit there through an entire trial and get up at the very end and say, I, I didn't actually kill him because I was a racist. I killed him because he stole money from me last week. Or, or yet another reason. And then all of a sudden, the jury's looking at me, and, and they have nowhere to go. If I can prove the underlying offense first, I, have, I actually would enjoy having a, 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 the, an ability to go back to the jury and ask for that hate crime penalty. And in what I recommended, I think you had recommended, uh, uh, Representative Gillard also in his, uh, recommended a five-year uh, increase. I went a little bit further than that. I think if it's a murder case, I think it's a life sentence. But I think from the standpoint of an additional five-year penalty, basically you're moving up a class, uh, a felony class on every one of your statutes, and I think that's appropriate. So if it's, an, a, so if it's a 10-year felony, it moves up to a 15-year a felony. And so that's what I recommended. So from my perspective, if it's, a, if it's a statute that I can use for a sentence enhancement, but it can be bifurcated, it's, a little, it's more work, but it... It, it insulates that underlying offense, and that's the concern I think most prosecutors would have with bringing it. Uh, I guess the question I would have with the bifurcation, if someone committed the, it, it wouldn't go into the element of the criminal charge because it's not a standalone offense, and maybe I'm talking out right. of, but um, it's my understanding, not my understanding, but it was my purpose and intent is maybe the discretion of the judge could enhance the penalty if it's shown to be here was my concern with that i agree committed with because of some bias based upon a race religion gender whatever it may I, be. i'm concerned about a, about a, a united states supreme court case by the name of apprendi i think is the name of it I'm, i may have that wrong but um th there is a case in which if you are sentencing somebody if they're going to face an enhanced sentence 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 provision you need to prove it to the jury and I think I'm right about that, and that's what concerned me, because if I've got to prove it to the jury, I don't want to prove it in that case in chief. I want to be able to, and I don't mind going back and doing that extra work. If we're just leaving it up to the judge, they've got a sentence range from 30 to life on murder. That's not going to be, that's not going to matter. But if they have a 10-year cap and they want to go to 15, I think they have to go back to the jury. I, I think I'm right about that, and I, that was my concern, and that's why I bifurcated it, or at least recommended a bifurcated statute. Um, and I'll, I'll check on that. Is that correct? I, I think okay. um, and I'll check, because this statute was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. It was modeled after the Wisconsin right. state statute, okay. which went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it was upheld. So I've got to be able to reconcile the case you referenced right. in the case that the U.S. Supreme Court did render on this, but I appreciate your insight. And, Certainly. And we don't have to Thank get you. into that discussion right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bernstein. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Solicitor Stone, <clears throat> and I appreciate your uh, willingness to, to work with us as we, as we um, confront this, this problem and, and hope to piece together some legislation. A couple issues I just wanted to ask you about. Uh, the drug court, from what I hear, Duffy, on, in some circuits, is that there's a hesitancy to, for the solicitor to recommend drug court because the case, and I'm not saying in your circuit, sure. I, don't, I refer cases down there, but um, that... You should that come down there. I'm not that hard to work with. Well, I'm not. <laughs> um, that the, yeah, I am. I'm very difficult. <laughs> that, the, uh, that the case still stays on the books while the, uh, with, yeah, as right. far as court administration is concerned. So there's a hesitancy to refer the case to drug court because drug court can take up to a year. 18 months. In some 18 cases. months. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, particularly if the person has to start over, or you know, if, you know. So there's a hesitancy because that that number, that case, still stays on your court administration log. So I'm hearing that. Would would how would you reconcile that? Would that if you refer it to drug court, does it come off the solicitor's books, so to speak? You're absolutely right, and I don't know if that's that's a hesitation, but I think it's a legitimate issue that needs to be addressed. I think it works the same way with the disorderly con I'm not disorderly con uh, conditional, conditional discharge. Conditional discharge. In fact, I think you've got the same situation where they're staying on the dock. What I have asked, actually, and I've talked to 
um, our commission about and, and making a recommendation. In fact, we've actually reached out to court administration. If they could create, all they have to do is create a category of, of uh, cases in which the resolution is pending or another category. That's all they have to do. Instead of just pending, this would also fit pretrial intervention. People that are in pretrial intervention, I, not only can I take them off the books, I can't even make a notation that anyone's in pretrial intervention. It's against the, stat, the state statute. Um, an alternate resolution category at the South Carolina Department of, of uh, the Judicial Department would solve, I believe, that problem. I believe it would solve the problem for drug court, pretrial intervention, uh, conditional discharge, and anything else. You've got an alternative disposition category. Those cases go over there, and then they're not looking like we're sitting on the case and not doing anything for 18 months. Because right. you're right, they do. The, the program lasts. It, it's, it's very thorough. It's very difficult to get through. It's not easy. But it lasts generally about 18 months in some cases, and that's all individual-based, and you don't want to shorten that because you're trying to reduce your docket. I, to me, the easy answer is ask court administration to create a resolu uh, uh, an alternative and resolution have done category. That? Have y'all done that? We have. I don't know where they are on that. I, I've, I've talked to... Uh, um, uh, I'm trying my best not to turn around and stare at Lisa Catalanato, who's probably thinking I'm staring at her anyway. Um, but yeah, we've actually talked about that, and I think we've actually sent the message to the court administration and asked them to consider that. Okay. Because I think it probably is a computer change, but that's that's something that would solve that problem. Right. Um, recommendation seven: um, You uh, implement sentence reform, and as you know, uh, a number of us uh, on this committee have have worked tirelessly. Uh, on sentencing reform, and we received a lot of headwinds from the Solicitors Association on our efforts. So I'm glad to see in writing that you are for implementing sentencing reform, and I hope you can join us yep. uh, in that legislation. Now, to that vein, you also recommend 85% of all sentences, regardless of the type of crime, you, you receive an 85% sentence. Um, would that then negate the need for mandatory minimums? If everybody knew you were getting 85% of whatever the judge said, would you need to have sentence, uh, mandatory minimums? I, let me answer that in, in three different ways. First, there is a reason that I put it as number 7A, 7B, and 7C, <laughs> because I think you have to take them together. And I think that probably is a little bit of the resistance that you've seen, at least for me as a prosecutor, for, for sentence reform in the past, because I think it's been one end but not taking them all together. Second, if I can answer that as the 14th Circuit Solicitor, um, if we're not talking about murder, and we're not talking about rape, and we're not talking about armed robbery, but you're talking about the drug offenses, which are the ones that are the minimum mandatory sentences that really, I think, cause most people the heartache. I would absolutely trade that for 85%, yes. Because what I'm doing is I'm trusting the judge to give the appropriate sentence because I think we already trust the judge in a, in, in a, lot, of, in a lot of ways. And if the judge is going to hand a sentence, I think it'd be fair for everybody in the courtroom to know it. But I'm answering that as the 14th Circuit because I don't know that every solicitor would agree with me. But I would. Thank you, Duffy. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman. Um, quickly, uh, solicitor on the hate crimes, and you talk about a bifurcated. I think it's very important, and I've had in several years of discussions now with Ms. Bernstein and some members. Uh, they don't want to be symbolic with the hate crimes. They want to do it for a legitimate reason. Um, your bifurcated approach, could the same thing be done? And I understand your concern. You don't want the jury back there arguing about was it because Ms. Bernstein was Jewish or the fact that they just assaulted her. You know, I understand that, for example. Could you do it in a verdict form as opposed to a bifurcation? Here's where I'm heading with that. My concern is, your prosecutors are overwhelmed as it is, I just think it's probably going to be less used if you're going to have to almost have a pseudo death penalty. And I understand you wouldn't be qualifying jurors the same. But, you know, in the civil world now, we ask the jury all kind of questions. You know, did you find that they did blank? And so you do your murder proving, for example. And you could also say the second question on the verdict form being something similar to, do you find that this was done in whatever the hate? 
crime language right. would be? What, what are your thoughts? I, you know, the, the special verdict form, and I think that was actually part of the original legislation, and I, I, I think, and I think we ended up making sure that we put that back in there. That may very well solve it. I just want to make sure from a constitutional standpoint it does, and if it means that I have to do more work to do it, I'd rather do that. My concern is I totally agree with you, uh, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, that, that um, I don't want a statute that's simply symbolic. I want a statute that I can actually use. If I have to prove another element, that's going to be rarely used. And, and I don't want to be in a position of losing the underlying offense because the jury gets hung up in the jury room about the why, because the why is often very difficult to prove. If a special verdict, if we think from a constitutional standpoint that a special verdict form will satisfy that, that's perfectly fine with me. And again, I, I didn't, I, I, when I put these recommendations in there, I put them in there sort of as a starting point for the discussion. But my, my main concern is it just cannot be taken as an individual element of the underlying crime. If it is, it won't be used. I, I don't believe any prosecutor will use it unless they absolutely have to. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Stone? If not, thank you, Mr. Stone, for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chairman Ruffin. Thank you, Chairman Simmerle, and uh, thank you, Solicitor Stone. And as you relinquish the microphone, I want everybody to know that Duffy Stone is someone that is not a Johnny come lately to these issues. He has called me on numerous occasions talking about things like civil asset forfeiture, talking about sentencing reform, long before even most of them were issues up here. Uh, so thank you for your comments. At this point, we will hear from Solicitor Gibson, and he and I were in law school together, and he is currently the Fifth Circuit Solicitor. He is in charge of the training grounds where a lot of us received our training, including Duffy and myself and Tommy. So, Solicitor Gibson, if you would. Good afternoon, all. I almost said may it please the court, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to give anybody a promotion or demotion or whatever you may think that is. Um, so, um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for having me today uh, to the distinguished members of this committee and, uh, and to uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. Um, I think that you guys um, have now drawn the perfect straw because after hearing from um, our law professor from the uh, University of Georgia and after hearing from my solicitor Stone, um, some of my thunder has now been stolen and so I will not have to retread a lot of the ground that we planned on. So I'm going to go in a slightly different direction to give you a couple other things to think about. Um, I will say this, uh, as it relates to body cams, uh, things that were talked about with, uh, with body cams that both Solicitor Stone and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Associate Dean of the Law School over at the University of Georgia mentioned, um, we do need, uh, and, and let me be very clear about this, we do need systems in place so that that information that is collected on body cams can be transferred to solicitors immediately. Um, having dealt with in this circuit, in the Fifth Circuit, an officer involved shooting, it takes oftentimes, uh, although that was uh, investigated by a uh, by SLED, an independent agency, it takes a period of time for that information to get to my office to review. If we have a database or, or, or a way of transmitting that information so that we can get it as quickly as Solicitor Stone gets it, um, that's going to be helpful to us. Um, we see that it's no longer um, acceptable for it to take six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks to make decisions in situations where somebody has died. We have to be able to make those, those, those decisions much quicker. So in order to make those decisions much quicker, we're going to need the infrastructure to make that happen. That infrastructure requires better case management systems um, that all of the 16 circuits of solicitors have. Um, there are different uh, platforms that are out there, but two major ones that have been talked about. But we need that type of funding so that we can get that information, we can review that information quickly, and we can be transparent to the public immediately because that is what is required these days. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to say, and I, I know that our representative uh, Rutherford has heard me say it many times, we now live in a microwave society where people expect to have information at their fingertips immediately. And, you know, the, the wheels of justice have traditionally turned slowly, but we've got to grease those wheels a little bit to make them turn more quickly so that we can do the jobs that we need to do and we can do them as effectively as possible. So that's one thing I'll ask you as it relates to body camera information. So as I said, I'll take a slightly different approach and, and talk a little bit about what I'm going to call the three Ps. Um, I think that as we, uh, as you give me an opportunity to, uh, to talk to you for a minute, we've got to talk about reforms and looking at the three Ps. Those Ps being the people, police, and policy. All right, the people, the police, and policy. 
And as we talk about those three Ps, we have to just be painfully honest with ourselves as we ask questions uh, in, in terms of why we do the things that we do, why have we traditionally done them, why are we doing the things that we do. And as we ask that question, we have to listen to that answer and be prepared to hear the answer and then make the reforms necessary to make those transitions. Um, I'll suggest to you that my history is this. It's not a suggestion, it's the truth. Um, I practiced criminal defense work, law for about 21 or so years before being elected as the Fifth Circuit Solicitor. So I'm in a unique position. I know Solicitor Stone uh, practiced uh, criminal law for a while, but I'm in a unique position of, of spending most of my career uh, doing criminal defense work. And now after being uh, the elected solicitor for about 18 months, there's a different perspective that I'm seeing. And there's some things that I'll suggest to you that can excuse me, that can help us bridge those three Ps as we try to ensure that, uh, that, that, that we're gaining the trust of our, uh, of our constituents, of our communities, we're keeping that trust, and that we're always doing the right thing. And if we can make that promise and, and, and make all of our best efforts to, to doing the right thing all of the time, not just when it's convenient, but doing it all of the time, that's going to get us to a position where we as South Carolinians can always stand up and talk about the promise that we have and the promise that, 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 we're, that we've made to our constituents and to our people that we're going to do the right thing by them. So let's start with the people. One of the questions that I think we have to ask if we're talking about police reforms is why do people run? We've got to ask that question. Why do people run? When engaged with law enforcement, why do people run? In my years of, of defending people and now as the uh, Fifth Circuit solicitor, I've kind of seen three major categories, and there may be more, but I'm just, uh, I'll, I'll suspend it to three, or I'll, I'll try to pare it down to three major categories. First, you hear there's fear of police. Second, you hear, hear oftentimes there are pending charges that somebody may have, and they're afraid that if they're arrested, they're going to have to do more time in jail, they're going to be there for a period of time, and they're going to, and, 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 and because of those pending charges, they sometimes flee, they sometimes run, they, they sometimes attempt to evade police. In third, you hear sometimes the folks are just outright breaking the law, and they run because they want to run. So let's take that last category and put that to the side for a moment and talk about the first two, which is fear of the police and so, and uh, sometimes having pending charges that need to be taken care of. I suggest to you that in my years of practicing, many of the times that you saw people run, it was because there were some pending charges, whether it be something as simple as driving under suspension, there may be a firearm under the car, unlawful carrying of a, of a pistol, which is a misdemeanor, which is something that we should talk about, um, enhanced penalties for unlawful carrying of a pistol. That's something we should talk about at some point in time. But, um, but again, Oftentimes it's driving under suspension. It may be a child support warrant. It may be something uh, to, to the lines of, of, of a bench warrant of some sort for missing a court date in a magistrate's court. But oftentimes people are driving, they get blue lighted, and uh, they start thinking these thoughts as well. If I stop, I may go to jail, so let me just try to evade police and see what happens. And it puts everybody in a bad situation because that decision was made. I'm suggesting to you this. If we could create something through legislation and this is something we're working on on a local side, but if we could create through legislation something called safe zones, meaning places where people who have misdemeanor offenses, whether they be driving under suspension, whether it be um, um, a child support warrant, something along those lines, knows that they are driving and they are under suspension or that they, their license is not proper, they don't have insurance, something along those lines, they can at any point in time self-report. They can go and they can go to a magistrate's office, whether it be the solicitor's office. They can go, they can self-report. They can explain the fact that, number one, hey, I have a pending warrant. We can, at that point in time, work through what the underlying situation is. And if there's a driving under suspension, maybe there's a way to, well, I won't say maybe there's a way, there's a way to put that person on a payment plan and start paying for, um, um, number one, the underlying offense that got them driving under suspension. Two, get the license reinstated. And three, maybe have them driving on a restricted license until those other factors are taken care of. At that point, you've now addressed one of those major factors that, 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 that has people oftentimes attempting to evade police and putting everybody in an untenable situation. It does a couple things. Number one, again, it, it gives them an, an absolute opportunity to get back on the road, get on the road a little bit more quickly. They can get on the road properly. They can pay the underlying fines, and they can, can, can deal with the underlying causes that cause them to be suspended. But at the same time, it, it, it gives them the opportunity to continue to drive to work. As we know in South Carolina, 
we do not have a mass transit system that speaks to what needs to happen if you live in rural areas or even if you live in Columbia or if you live in Greenville, Spartanburg area. You do not have you do not have subways. You do not have sometimes reliable bus transportation that can get you all the places that you need to go. So if your license is suspended, what happens? You have a, an adverse effect on if you don't drive. You have the adverse effect of not being able to act, you know get back and forth to work, and and you're in a position where sometimes you're unable to take care of your families. So I ask that you consider first of all safe zones that allow for some of the minor offenses to uh, allow a self-reporting aspect of this that can sometimes get us away from having these police encounters where people make bad decisions running on very minor offenses. Two, as it relates to child support warrants, again, that's something that doesn't fall into the criminal jurisdiction. But again, I think in the Walter Scott situation specifically, there was a child support matter that was, that was underlying, that was one of the underlying reasons why he um, um, made the decision to walk to, to, to uh, step away from police. Again, if there is that opportunity to have a safe zone where we can go and say, hey, look, I'm behind the child support. This is what my issue is. Um, is there a way that I can work and I can con continue to do these things? You're taking this money out of, my out, of, uh, out of my check. Can we do something? Can we put something together to where I can keep my license, to where I can work, and I do not have to you know, go to work or, or, or go back and forth afraid that I'm going to be stopped and placed in jail because of child support more? Um, child support is important. It needs to be paid. If you're under an order to pay it, it needs to be paid. But there has to be a way to kind of decriminalize that aspect of the child support system so that people lose some of that incentive to run or what they believe is an, is, is an incentive to run. Again, looking at safe zones where these types of things can happen. Um, my belief is that if we do this, if we create these zones, um, you are going to have a percentage of people who will not be arrested and you'll have a percentage of people who will not be running or trying to evade police. And that in itself is an opportunity to save lives. It's an opportunity to keep families together and to do the things that we say uh, we're, 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 we're committed to doing. Third, bench warrants. Um, if you're not aware, a bench warrant is oftentimes is a warrant that's issued if a person has a, a criminal offense and fails to appear in court. Again, I'm not talking about the more major criminal situations. I'm talking about some of the more, you know, the, the simpler matters in magistrate's court, driving under suspensions, uh, and, and, and things of that nature, some of the simple assaults, some of the things that we're finding in magistrate's court. If a person misses a court date, whether they move, or, and, and, and you're going to see this. Just trust me, you will see this in this because of the, uh, the post, as we're living through COVID, the, uh, through the, the way the courts have been structured through COVID-19. People are moving from place to place. If a person fails to change their, uh, their address, a court date is sent to the last known address of, you know, to where this person lived. If they miss that court date, a bench warrant can be issued for their arrest. And if they're stopped at that point in time, a person can have to uh, serve whatever that you know, period of time is. If they're tried in their absence, they'll have to serve that particular sentence. So what I'm suggesting is that if we have a situation for these minor offenses, if a person has a bench warrant and they know about it, again, they can go to these safe spaces. They can uh, speak to uh, court personnel. They can speak to a prosecutor. Um, get back on track, change that information in the system so that they're not needlessly picked up on a situation they can be worked with. And again, we can avoid some of these um, types of law enforcement interactions that have been taking place for relatively minor situations. The second P that I mentioned to you a moment ago was <clears throat> police. So if we talk about, I talked about questions that you have to ask. One of the questions I suggest to you is, uh, what can happen to engender public confidence in the police? Again, what needs to happen to engender more public confidence in the police? And I'd say there are three T's there. There's testing, there's training, and there's transparency. Testing, is, uh, as our professor talked about earlier, is yearly psychological evaluations of police officers, I think, needs to be a starting point. Um, as, as anybody who may be certified or who may carry a concealed weapons permit, you know that every several years you have to um, actually you have to go back and refill that application out, resubmit it to SLED. But officers actually every year have to qualify or be certified in order to carry a weapon. Um, 
My belief is the mind is one of the most powerful weapons that we have if we choose to use it properly. And so we need to always be, especially if you're an officer, if there's, you should always have a yearly psychological evaluation that talks about, you know, what you've been through that particular year, if there are any post-traumatic stress disorder issues that you may have been confronted with, those things need to be talked about. And there needs to be a safe space where officers can talk about that and they're not penalized for um, expressing some of the things or some of the trepidation that they may have. Um, what you'll find, some officers will tell you that, well, I really don't want to talk about that because if I do, then all of a sudden I'm going to get, there's going to be a red mark by my name and they're going to say I'm not able to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to be qualified for certain positions and I may not be able to climb up the food chain to become, you know, in higher command because I've now expressed one of my weaknesses or one of my flaws. But we need to have those things so that officers are yearly tested psychologically um, and, and, and that should be a state standard. Um, it should be the minimum standard that we have. Just like we have minimum qualification standards for, for lawyers, for doctors, for pharmacists, um, there should be a minimum qualification standard, set of standards here as well. Um, I suggest to you that more training um, needs to, to be something that you look at as well. Um, and I'm moving more, more quickly through this because I know you've, you've heard a lot of information, so um, I'll just continue to move quickly through these matters. And if you have questions, please stop me. Um, we need a uniform set of standards for hiring police officers. Um, I think that uniform um, set of standards, whether it be in Columbia, whether it be in Allendale, whether it be in, in, uh, in Traveler's Rest, doesn't matter. There should be a state standard so we all know that all police officers are looking or reading off the same sheet of music as they are um, as they're filling out applications. And we are, we're, at, we're asking similar questions and we can compare those questions if need be in, the, in, 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 in those databases that we've talked about. If we're creating those things, we'll have information about officers um, as, as they're being interviewed and as they are working um, and, and as they're doing the thing, as they're policing. If they're having missteps in their policing, those things need to be cataloged. So in, in this database that we've talked about, you'll have that information so we all know who's being hired at all times. Uh, one thing that I've seen over my years of practicing is, especially as you get to smaller municipalities, uh, some people call it gypsy policing. You sometimes hear that term used. And you'll have an officer who may, I won't call different towns, but you'll have town A and officers in town A and does a few things that may get him or her fired in town A. He or she will move over to town Z and uh, maybe 30 miles away, it may be two counties away. But they'll continue to do the same things in that particular municipality until they run afoul of that and then move to another municipality and they just kind of keep moving around. And so you hear that sometimes affectionately called gypsy policing. Uh, there needs to be a record of that so that um, as, as I'm doing my job as a prosecutor, if there's a, a case that comes to us, uh, we, re we uh, receive the discovery request from Mr. McKnight or Mr. Rutherford or Mr. Pope or, or Mr. Murphy, we send them all of the things we have. We don't have a file that speaks to all of the things that an officer could have done in the past. So we can't share it with you if we don't know it. But if you provide a system so that we have all of that information, there's that transparency that, first of all, the uh, defendant is entitled to, but the transparency that all of us need to know. Um, if there are certain issues that officers have gotten themselves into, we need to be able to share those with you because that's, number one, is our job. That's the law. But we can only do and provide the information that we have. So give us a few more um, um, tools that we can use so that we can do our jobs properly and make sure that we are, 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 are doing our job, which is to do just, excuse me, which is to do justice at all times. Um, we talked about yearly continuing education requirements. Um, a nuance is something that I've studied and, and read about a little bit, I think is something that we should consider, is uh, encouraging officers to live in the neighborhoods that they police. I'll say that again, encouraging officers to live in the neighborhoods that they police. They're actually loan programs that um, some people call good neighbor next door loans, but um, different municipalities will offer those loans for officers to receive a lesser interest rate to live in certain communities so that they can now become a fixture in that community. If you're living with people, if people are your neighbors, you're going to treat them better because you will learn a little bit more about them. And you'll be able to you'll learn how to, uh, to interact with, with the children, with the, with the community leaders, with all of those folks, because you're now a part of that community. And that is one of the bases of community policing. So I suggest to you um, looking at legislation or, or encouraging officers or encouraging lower interest loans, things of that nature, to attract officers to move into communities so that they'll be a part of those communities that they're actually policing. Um, I think it's sad when you look and say, hey, this is a, an officer who works in this particular state, you know, city. 
but lives 40 or 60 miles away and they're driving back and forth. It becomes a job. But if you live in that particular community, you're going to do what you need to do to make sure that, 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 that it's policed properly, that you're a part of the community. People can knock on the door, call you by your first name. You know what's going on. Um, there are officers who I've known, and they'll say, hey, I've been a police officer for 30 years, and I've had to pull my gun one time or no times. And the reason being is because they have those relationships. And if you can establish those relationships because these are your neighbors, you're going to treat your neighbors a little bit differently than somebody you just roll up on who you just happen to, to see uh, walking around on the street. Lastly, I'll turn to policy. And again, I'll move rapidly through this. I think the question has to be asked, what policies are helping us bridge the divide between law enforcement and communities? Um, we, we talked about policies of de-escalation training. Um, again, um, the, uh, the um, associate dean talked about some of that de-escalation training. I, I, I'd suggest that that's something that you consider, and we can talk more about that if necessary. Um, Diverse hiring practices need to be discussed. Um, I think it's a shame to look at a police force and it doesn't look like the community that it polices. I'll say that again. It's a shame to look at a police force that does not look like the community it polices. We have to attract African American officers, Hispanic officers, um, officers of Asian descent, all different types of officers because that's what we have in this state. And our police forces need to look like the people that we are policing. That can be done through, through <clears throat> not necessarily defunding, but adjusting the funding and spending the funding and the monies that the that, that that police agencies uh, receive and spending them for training purposes, spending that money to bring in officers who are better qualified. And if you raise the level of the officers there, not defunding, but raising the level of the officers there, you'll bring in better officers. You bring in better officers, and you get better results. And that is not casting stones at any of the officers that we have. I'm suggesting that we can always do a better job, and we need to be committed to doing a better job. Again, if we're going to talk about these hard things, we have to ask the hard questions. We have to listen to the hard answers sometimes. And if we're going to make a difference, this is the time to make a difference. I suggest to you, as you're looking at legislation, Conviction integrity units is something that, um, that's talked about and it's been talked about and it's something that I think um, we need to be looking at in our communities and in our state. Uh, conviction integrity units, one that could be housed. We have a, a, we have a university here, University of South Carolina. We have a law school right here. And if you look at the model for conviction integrity units, they often include a prosecutor, a defense attorney, they include a uh, law enforcement officer, and, uh, and sometimes a law professor. And they'll look at questionable convictions. And as they look at questionable convictions that, that reach a certain threshold, they'll look at those convictions, they'll investigate and ensure that discovery was produced like it was supposed to, and they'll sometimes go back, reread transcripts, re-interview witnesses, and to see if there are things that are glaring that stand out that suggest that justice was not done. Again, if we are looking at ways to raise um, the level of our state, to raise the credibility that the law enforcement, the prosecutors have, um, Making sure that the right people are convicted is one of the ways to do that. So I, I'd ask you to look into uh, conviction integrity units and look at housing one at the University of South Carolina. Um, there has been uh, there have been different committees throughout the last several years, you know, in South Carolina, right here in Columbia, that have looked at doing that type of thing. But I suggest to you that it's it's time to start looking into those matters because there have been histories of injustices that are done, and if we we're talking about justice. Justice is a continuum, and we have to ensure that what we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is proper, even today. So I suggest to you that that's something that we need to be looking at as well. So as we, again, many of the things that I was going to talk about have been retread, so there's no need for me to, to, to go into those matters, but I thank you for your time. Um, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Um, but I'll tell you this, we're committed to doing the best that we can in doing justice as prosecutors in this county. Uh, in the Fifth Circuit, I know the Solicitor Stone is, is committed as well. And, uh, and we are here to, uh, to serve. We're going to work hard and we're going to do all that we can to, uh, to ensure that uh, the justice is done. Speaker Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Solicitor, you had talked about the gypsy policing, and I think we've heard that several times. And yes, I think in, in my law enforcement experience, you always knew the guy that 
you knew he kind of got in trouble, you know, in a small town, and then he's kind of gone, and you know, two years later, you hear an incident, and he, like you said, two yeah. counties over. Um, I had actually gotten contacted, I guess, more from from kind of a municipality county association employment law situation, um, and I'm sharing this, I guess, as much for our committee when they work on it. Um, the problem I think you run into somewhat is I'm chief of police in York and you're chief over in Sumter and you call me and say, I'm thinking about hiring Billy. Right. I said, well, our town attorney tells me I can tell you he did work here for two years mm -hmm. and he has left here now. You know, and that's all they can share. And I think part of it's kind of a civil liability thing. They're concerned from an employment law. Sure. I, I know what I assume you and Solicitor Stone are talking about is you need that same information, maybe for different reasons, but um, do you think it, 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 there's something that's going to take legislative action to free up the opportunity for you to hear those things? Or, you know, maybe, hopefully it never comes to the solicitor point because the chief, when I call, you know, Chief Gibson and tell him, well, here's what I can tell you because I've got, whether it's an immunity situation or something, but I've got the opportunity that I can clearly disclose that. Do you think that's helpful? Uh, I think that um, when you talk about legislation, if you can give a bright line test that, that says this is the standard, this is what's required, this is what needs to happen, that makes it simpler for us to do our jobs. When you leave it to the interpretation of every other municipality that's out there, you're going to get a highest priority information. And I understand on the, on the employment side why you have to give that answer. I mean, we all have to give that answer if there's a, a question about a, you know somebody who may have had a, a, a situation here or there. But if you can, again, if we're talking about specific issues with police, I think it's important enough. I mean, we're not talking about um, somebody flipping burgers at the local joint. I mean, it's important enough if a person is, it, you know, has, you know, they've taken this oath to serve and protect. They have the ability to carry a weapon. They have the ability to do certain you know, to, to take a person's liberty. Um, and there, there's so many things that are out there that that person can do. I think we, we need to have more stringent uh, regulations or at least regulations that are going to be more transparent so we can all tell what that person's doing. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Transparency, we need to give the authority to these agencies to share that information yes. because you are asking for somebody that's going to be carrying a gun and doing so. so we need to do whatever we need to do to make sure that 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 when when you call me and ask me about the guy you're thinking about hiring, then I have to say, look, here's the real reason. Exactly. He and if work. you choose to hire that person, then that's your decision at that point. But at least you've had all the information that's required. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and you take that at your you take that information at your own risk at that point. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Solicitor Gibson, it's always good to see you. You've been a breath of fresh air for the Fifth Circuit um, Solicitor's Office. So thank you for being here today also, um, my home um, district. You know, I, I wrote down exactly what you said, and I agree. Police force should look like community at polices, and I agree with that. Do you have, how is Richland County and City of Columbia as far as demographics, and, and how can we recruit um, members of the African-American community and the Hispanic community into the police force or to, to really help get the police force to look like the community of polices because I do think that makes yeah. I, I think it's, it's going to be like, uh, like all professions. Um, you're going to have to put forth the effort. <clears throat> um, you can't just you know, have open applications and just wait for whoever knocks on the door to come. I mean, I think you got to do the same thing that you're doing with, um, I mean, what does the FBI do? I mean, I understand it's federal. I know money's different. But, you know, when you, when I was in, you know, the college in Charleston, I can remember going to a job fair and seeing, you know, all these different agencies that are there looking for people to, uh, you know, to join the agencies. I think you're going to have to do that. Um, if, if you're looking at, um, you just have to be more aggressive about it. And I think that the, Similar to teachers, um, you have to offer a salary where a person can make a living and, 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 and can raise a family. Um, and that can be incentivized by, you know, maybe the training that a person receives and they continue to, 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 to show and prove that they're going to, you know, handle business in a certain way, that they're going to, um, to be exemplary in the way that they handle their business. I think you do those things and you can start to attract, um, attract um, you know, the best candidates that are out there. And again, that's not to speak poorly about anyone who's there, but um, 
oftentimes you're seeing officers who have made decisions because of pay, because of just the scrutiny now that's out there. They're saying, you know what, I don't want to do this. I can do something else. But, um, but there is a large segment of the population, uh, peoples of color and otherwise, who still um, want to be police officers. So we have to incentivize it. You incentivize it by possibly, again, low interest loans in some areas. You know, you, you, you get you, just like you do teachers. You do prosecutors the same way. If you do, uh, or in, in public defenders, if you work in this particular area for this amount of time, we'll forgive this amount of the loan that you may have. I mean, there are ways to do it, to incentivize and to attract good candidates. But one of the things is you got to pay good candidates. You got to do that. And so I think if we do those things and we, um, you know, the, I think the Untouchables was a line that came from that movie where the question was, well, you know, where do I go and get an officer that, uh, in, that in that particular situation, they're talking about corruption. Um, I'm not equating that to this conversation, but they said, well, where do you go? He said, well, you go to the tree and you pick it right off the tree. So you got to go and pick, pick them off the tree. Pick the, pick the people off the tree that you want and, and, and make offers that are real offers and, and um, give, give, give people a chance to be trained properly and to, and, and real opportunities to, to, to treat it as a career, and I think you'll see more people do that. Representative mm -hmm. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Solicitor Gibson, thank you very much for your testimony today. And uh, Solicitor Selman, thank you for yours also. It's always a, a breath of fresh air, I, I feel, to have uh, uh, comments and, and, and these sorts of suggestions and recommendations coming from people who are in the arena who are dealing with these issues on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. Uh, the wealth of experience that you bring is, uh, is, is certainly invaluable in my, in my mind uh, to this whole conversation that we're having here. I've got uh, uh, several questions. I'll start and, and do them individually if I uh, could. One of those I haven't uh, heard from either one of them. I'd like to hear from, from both you and Solicitor Stone about that. And that is the, uh, one of the things that we have had to take and do over the uh, the last few months is to move away from in-person uh, meetings as well as court hearings. And so many of the courts have been shut down at this point in time. Uh, and one of the things I was looking to hear from uh, you guys is how that has gone, because I've had the, the pleasure or displeasure or whatever of, of, of being a part of two uh, court hearings uh, that were done virtually over the last uh, few months. And the pleasure or displeasure also of, a, of attending a number of uh, meetings and uh, uh, presentations and other things like that on a virtual basis. But it would seem to me because of that, we have also built up uh, some resources and some uh, uh, expertise in doing that, that we should probably look at for certain types of offenses and certain types of uh, uh, criminal activity and for paroles. Uh, parole hearings and appointments for parole officers and things like that that would seem to make sense to continue that going forward. So uh, I'd like to pose that to, uh, question to you uh, first off is to what is your thoughts on that particular issue? Right. Because it does relate to a process issue I think that we might could take and, and use that would, would certainly make things a little more efficient going forward. Sure. Um, thank you. We, we've all gotten uh, used to, and thank you for that question, we've all gotten uh, at this point used to virtual courts, um, Zoom court or WebEx court, I think is, is what, is, well, that's the platform that's being used in, uh, in the Fifth Circuit. And so um, they're, they're, the benefit of it is that, I mean, again, you know, in this, in this COVID environment, you're not having to have the in-person. And, uh, and you can, theoretically, if, if the technology is good, you can move a, you know, a certain amount of cases in a period of time and everybody, you don't have the transport issues that you have from the local jail. Um, you can have a defense attorney who's in his or her office, or maybe they'll come to a room in the courthouse and, and handle their business. The judge can be someplace, the prosecutor somewhere else. And so as you're doing all of those, um, it does work. But, um, but I tell you, there's certain types of cases that that's difficult to do. I mean, if we're talking about something that's called transfer court, or we're talking about, um, again, misdemeanors and some of the, the lighter, um, what we have termed as nonviolent um, felonies and some other misdemeanors, um, or, or, or situations where there's not a victim, um, it's easy to handle them that way. But when you're talking about victims, um, it's difficult to tell somebody who's uh, lost a loved one or who's um, a headed loved one who's injured to say, hey, you know, we're going to have this call and you got to sit on this call and, and uh, you get to speak when the judge tells you to speak, but you got to mute at this particular time. It's, it's difficult. And quite frankly, I mean, uh, I'm very pleased to be in a room with this, you know, with people for a change and, uh, 
Uh, I get to, you know, see some of my friends in this room. Uh, care what you ask, well, but, uh, but it's good to sit in here because there's certain things you'll never pick up watching, you know, on the screen. And, and just sometimes this year, um, you need to feel that tension. You need to feel that emotion. You need to feel that angst sometimes when there's certain types of matters happening because you'll never get it over the camera. Um, we had the... Um, I don't mean to cut you off, but we got to move. Time. Yes, sir. The you know that long-winded, but... You know, I know Gary is, so y'all both... <laughs> y'all gotta... <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, on the uh, issue of uh, connection and in, uh, integrity unit, units, uh, it, it, I was trying to wrap my head, head around around that and, you know, exactly how that works. Do you know of any other locations or places that this is taking place that we could take a look at? Oh, absolutely. Get some yeah. eyes off from I, If you let us know that, then that would be very helpful. Sh Sure. From my there's standpoint. A, there's an innocence project in South Carolina that was that was formed. Um, it's uh, it, there's been a I won't say it's been a hiatus, but um, it, it, it didn't gain some of the traction that they wanted it to. That's kind of one of the models here. But you can look in major cities, whether it be New York, Philadelphia, or even small areas in Tennessee. And what they'll do is um, there, there's a criteria. Alabama has, has conviction integrity units. There's several there. There's some that are more well thought of than others. But um, the key is it's not just coming in and looking at this and, oh, we're going to overturn this because X, Y, and Z. There, there are data points that have to be looked at. There's information that has to be looked at. And you have independent um, 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 people, or, you know, you have an independent prosecutor who wasn't involved in the case. You have independent uh, uh, defense attorneys and others, uh, law enforcement as well. And also, you know, I mentioned law professors, but there's several, sometimes a social worker as well. But they sit and they go through and, and you know, each of the matters in the case and, uh, and determine whether or not, you know, based on the evidence, that things were done properly. Um, and if those things were done properly, then they, they move on. But you have to meet certain criteria to take the next step. And so I'd suggest, and I can, I can provide that to you. I'll be more than happy to do that after, after the meeting or even later this week, provide you just a few places that you can look at for that, that model. That would be very helpful. Absolutely. Um, on the, uh, the issues of uh, self-reporting and uh, uh, offenses and, and so forth, uh, uh, there, could you also give us some examples of places whenever you, you do so on the uh, con, uh, conviction integrity unit of places that we could look look to to uh, benchmark uh, uh, from? I think would be helpful. I, I know I'd certainly be interested in that. Um, police forces looking like uh, communities. I, I can tell you from my my standpoint and my experience uh, uh, working with local governments as, as administrator over a, a number of years. That, that I have had has been with the whole issue of standards, and you talked about standards and setting standards and so forth. Uh, one example of, uh, of that is that, you know, we traditionally get a lot of our law enforcement officers out of the military. One of the problems that we're having right now uh, with that is that uh, most of our standards also require that you not have any visible tattoos and so forth. So one of the issues that we're having is that is most of our officers that we're getting, particularly out of the military, uh, have to wear long sleeve shirts. Uh, our highway patrol officers. That's one of the problems we're having with recruiting uh, law enforcement officers for that. Those standards sometimes be, can be at direct conflict with that. Uh, so uh, that's one of the issues that we often have. Uh, and, <laughs> could I, I, mean, I, I, I say interrupt you, Justin? I mean, it's just, we got to understand we're lawyers. <laughs> that is, it's um, with tattoos, things of that nature, things that, uh, it's a generational thing. And I mean, I think that um, there's some things we got to decide what's most important. And is it the look or, or the quality? And mm -hmm. I can understand. And, and I think that's a, tr a true qualitative assessment that's got to be made. Because there's certain, you know, I, I prefer not to have somebody coming up like Post Malone, tattooed across the face, that kind of thing. There's a credibility <laughs> issue that you're going to get with that, if, you know, person coming in court, you with that, that. But, but I do understand. I mean, there's a military culture of tattoos in different places things like that, and that, that, that's something I think that we've just got to, um, we, we got to make the decision to, you know, if they're good people that are, that, are, that, that cut the mustard, um, is that something that can be relaxed a little bit? Yeah, and in some of the standards, uh, you know, you, you can't relax. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, DUI, uh, oh, domestic violence, and other things like that. Well, thank you very much. All the tattoos is what I thought. <laughs> yeah, appreciate the, uh, the comments, appreciate the information from uh, both both the listeners. Representative Kevin.
talking with us today. I usually don't have trouble with people hearing me, so I always forget to um, turn on my microphone for a while. Um, I wanted to talk with you about the safe zones that you were talking about earlier. Um, because typically when somebody has a bench warrant for child support or something like that, they have, have missed some kind of court hearing or something like that, or even if they have an outstanding warrant for driving under suspension, they've missed some type of court hearing. Um, and I agree with you that it's problematic when they get picked up on the side of the road and it seems to be the most inconvenient time and, um, you know, then they have to go get booked into the jail and it's just a big ordeal. But are these, how do these safe zones differ from them going into the local police station? Because they can go to the local police station and turn themselves in at any time. Is this, are these safe zones an effort to like maybe show up, just show up at family court at 9 o'clock in the morning. We'll take the emergency first. We'll take anybody that has an outstanding bench warrant first. And that'll take care of... Um, get your bench warrant resolved and maybe you won't have to go to jail. Is that how it works? Can you explain a little bit more? No, about I mean, my thought process in, in that is, is more of a, a place other than, uh, than going to family court or necessarily going to, uh, it, it would, you know, family court is, is going to be an animal unto itself, you know, um, but if we're talking about magistrate charges, magistrate level charges, if somebody missed a court date, um, it's one of those things, and, and, and it's happened in Richland County before where, um, it's almost like a forgiveness that you have a week. If you have these types of things, these outstanding matters, you can come in and, uh, you, you know, th there's gonna, you're going to come in, there's going to be an out a booking process, an outbooking process, uh, but you go home. And so you get to handle that matter. And, uh, and you go home, maybe with a new court date, maybe they set up a, you know, a plan of some sort so that you can work your way out of the payment plan of some mm -hmm. sort. And, uh, but you, the, the key is you do those things. You're doing it of your own volition, and when you're finished, when you've gone through that process, you go home. And so um, the incentive is to just handle it now, handle this, and you'll go home this particular day, and you don't leave it to some, you know, situation where, you know, it's, it's one of those most inconvenient times you get stopped after a Carolina game or something like that, and then all these other issues come up. This, it, it, it bears a certain amount of personal, personal responsibility in the person who's got that date. And so when it comes to family court, um, I suggest that there are more dynamics that have to be, you know, dealt with there. but. Um, if there's a work release aspect, you know, just I think there are different pieces to it that, all right, maybe a person has too much of a debt, but, you know, by sending them to jail, they may lose that job and other pieces, they may not be able to pay it. But if it's a work release, maybe they got to spend a night in jail, but they can still go work and come back. But just mm -hmm. lightening some of those rules so that you can allow people a chance to keep their families together to work and to work through some of these hardships, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're sitting in jail for longer periods of time than they need to, or county jails, especially. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And, and so I just want to remind all our panelists that, all, that we're going to break into subcommittees, so you will have a chance to get more detailed testimony from any presenter that you want to hear from or anybody that you want to talk to, so that you don't have to feel like if you're not asking your question now, you're going to leave the room and not ever be able to do it again. Uh, everybody out there is going to be available to you, and anybody that you need to hear from will be able to do that. So just didn't want everybody to think that they had to ask a question now or forever give it up. Here's up, Gideon. All right. Well, solicitor, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Right. Now we're going to hear from um, Seth Staunton, who is an associate professor of law at the University of, South, University of South Carolina. He comes from Florida, but he is currently teaching police law and policy, criminal procedure, criminal law, and regulation of vice at the University of South Carolina Law School. He is a former police officer and investigator from Florida, and he wrote a book in 2020 called Evaluating Police Uses of Force. Seth, are you with us? There he is. I am. Yeah. Thank you. I, <laughs> It'll be available in the lobby immediately after this. book signing. Yes. I appreciate that pitch. Uh, I will make my remarks as brief as possible, but I will also tell you that I was told I have about 35 minutes, so I have a lot to go over. I will trim as fast as I can. First, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for having me. Uh, committee members for being here, for letting me speak on this important issue. It's an honor to be included among this particular uh, group of experts. The observations and suggestions that I'm going to offer are based not just on my now eight years of academic experience, research into policing, six years here at the University of South Carolina School of Law and two additional years at Harvard Law School, but also on the seven and a half years that I spent as a city police officer and a state investigator in Florida, but please don't hold that part against me. 
as someone who has dedicated my career now to these issues, there is far more to talk about than I can possibly talk about in a day, let alone 35 minutes or a semester-long class. So my comments today are going to be limited. As an introductory note, when I talk about police or policing, I'm talk talking about any agency or individual who engages in policing. That includes sheriffs, offices, and departments, and deputies. I'm going to talk about nine discrete issues where legislative action is both warranted and, I believe, possible. Public safety infrastructure, data collection, training, decertification, body-worn cameras, use of force statutes, after-action investigations and sentinel event reviews, officer wellness, and policing for profit. There will be some duplication between my comments and what we've already heard. Mostly what I'm going to try and do is offer some additional data on some of those other topics. So please bear with me while I do that. First, with public safety infrastructure, I'd like to start with what police actually do in South Carolina. We have collectively left it to the police to, arrange, uh, to address a range of social problems that are simply beyond their capacity. Officers are not well trained or equipped, nor do they have the institutional facilities to handle issues like mental health, substance abuse, poverty, homelessness, school discipline, and so on. Yet, largely, that is what we rely on them to do. Most officers I know agree that they cannot solve these problems with the blunt instrument of their criminal justice powers. They know that at the end of the day, they really have one option, arrest. But we also hear more and more that these are problems that we cannot arrest our way out of. We have collectively created a society that relies on that blunt instrument of criminal law to deal with these issues because we have conflated policing and public safety. Policing is an important part of public safety, but it is only a part of an overarching public safety initiative. Worse, we have strategically defunded other aspects of our public safety infrastructure and left those problems up to the police to deal with. Let me give you a couple, well, one quick example. The South Carolina Department of Mental Health has in its custody, as you can tell from the name, a number of individuals who have mental health issues. It has its own police safety, the Public Safety Division, where officers get specialized training in interacting with and transporting individuals with mental illness. But they have been defunded. In some locations around the state, including here in Columbia, the Department of Mental Health has refused to transport individuals in its custody from one facility to another, or from a hospital to its facility, or from one of its facilities to a hospital. They call upon local police agencies and ask them to provide such transport services. But local officers are not well trained and not well equipped to transport individuals with mental illness who have committed no crimes. That's one very specific example. There are a whole range of others. And while the majority of my comments today will focus on what we can do to improve policing within policing, I urge this committee to also think about the need to address broader issues of criminal justice reform beyond just internal to policing changes so that we can better align what we ask of police with the reality of police capabilities. I want to shift to talk about data collection. Within policing, or with regard to the legal frameworks that you as the legislature create to regulate policing, we cannot make evidence-based assessments or policy proposals without data. Unfortunately, useful data about policing are seriously lacking. This committee can start remedying that lacuna of information by developing data collection efforts in four specific domains. Police encounters, uses of force, tactical team deployments and forcible entries, and police misconduct. I want to start with police encounters. In 2006, the state adopted a requirement for non-custodial stops to be reported. That is, stops that do not result in arrest or citation. These data are posted in the Department of Public Safety public contact reports. There is no centralized reporting for stops that involve citation. There is no centralized reporting for stops that involve arrest. So even with the existing reporting, we have no comprehensive data on the number of people searched, for example, or whether evidence was found when they are searched, or the like. This information is invaluable. It is not only critical to identifying potential problems, but also to finding potential solutions. 
Data from the New York Police Department's controversial use of stop and frisk, for example, found that officers were significantly more likely to stop and frisk black and Latino individuals, but more likely to find contraband on white individuals who they stopped and frisked. Findings like that might tell us that we need to adjust police training to give them better training on how to identify suspicious behavior so they don't unconsciously or implicitly associate race with suspicion. It's also possible, if we uh, gather that information, that we will find that agencies and officers are being unfairly accused of racial profiling or bias. I can't tell you one way or another without looking at the actual data, whether an officer or agency has a racial, uh, has disproportionate enforcement uh, on racial grounds. We need that data to, to tell. The lack of data here is an easily solvable problem. Five years ago, Representative Joe Neal and Senator Clementa Pinkney proposed to have all cops report all stops. In 2017, I personally spoke to state highway patrol officials who administer the public contact reporting system to determine if expanding it and capturing some of the information, like whether someone is searched and whether contraband was found, is technologically feasible. Not only is it technologically feasible, it would be easy to do. We just need a legislative mandate to do it. Switching to data collection on the use of force. If you give me a few minutes and an internet connection, I can tell you very easily how many metric tons of shellfish were imported into the United States. I can tell you down to each unit how many cars or light trucks were exported from the United States into any country in the world. And yet if you ask me how many times officers used a baton or a taser or shot at someone, I, despite having been a police researcher now for eight years, cannot get you that information. I can tell you about lethal shootings. There are about 1,000 every year. And the only reason we know that in the country is because of media efforts by Washington Post and other private organizations. But given the roughly 60 million plus police encounters every year, focusing on 1,000 lethal shootings, it's a very, very small sample. And it doesn't give us a representative understanding of what policing looks like in any one of those communities. A lethal shooting is inherently anomalous. If we want to understand what policing looks like in a particular neighborhood or jurisdiction, we need to know a lot more about low-level uses of force. How many times are officers punching people or bringing them to the ground or pepper spraying them, for example? These data already exist at the agency level. The Columbia Police Department has led the way by putting use of force information into its annual report. A few other agencies in the state do the same thing. But I can't tell you whether the Columbia Police Department or Charleston or any other agency is using more force than other agencies in the state or less force than other agencies in the state or whether they're about average because we don't centralize that data. As with police encounter data, Use of force data not only give us valuable information about how policing is actually done, it also helps us identify issues so that they can be corrected. A multi-state, uh, excuse me, a multi-year analysis of all use of force reports in the state of New Jersey, for example, found that smaller agencies used a disproportionately high amount of force. That is, smaller agencies used a lot more force than larger agencies which could suggest a couple of different reasons, but one of those reasons might be that smaller agencies don't have the resources to do a lot of additional training, the way that larger agencies do, and with that bare data, we can at least start to hone in on a training problem that we can then address. But without that data, we can't begin to address or even identify the issues. Now, data collection on tactical team deployments and forcible entries. A well-trained, well-equipped tactical team with a high degree of unit cohesion and trigger discipline can play a vital role in high-risk situations. But poorly trained tactical teams, including agency personnel with limited tactical training or interagency task forces that don't actually train together, can make a high-risk situation significantly worse, not better. This is particularly true when they engage in what are referred to as dynamic entry techniques. These are the no-knock entries that Professor Dennis mentioned earlier. In an amicus brief to the Supreme Court of the United States, I describe no-knock entries as being, quote, like dynamite, very powerful but inherently dangerous, and to be used only in situations where nothing else will do, end quote. 
Unfortunately, we've seen examples here in South Carolina of tactical operations in situations that do not justify the risk, including to raid a high school in Berkeley County. I point you to Exhibit 1 on your packet. We also have clear examples of botched raids, where officers used problematic tactics, including the raid that led to the shooting of Julian Benton and settlements totaling more than $11 million of taxpayer money. I point you to Exhibit 2. The overuse or misuse of tactical teams in no-knock entries not only endangers community members, it endangers officers. Rapid entries are used to induce confusion, but that confusion can result in someone picking up a gun or shooting at someone breaking into their home without realizing that the people kicking down the door are the police. Yet despite their inherent risks, I cannot begin to tell you how many forcible entries or tactical team deployments we have here in South Carolina or uh, what the circumstances of their use are. We can take a lesson from Utah, and I will point you to exhibit three and four, which requires uh, agencies to report tactical team deployments and forcible entries. There's no reason why we couldn't do the same thing here. Finally, police misconduct. I believe this has been adequately addressed, so I will just add very quickly, we truly need a statewide database for police misconduct, not just for the purposes that uh, Solicitor Stone and Solicitor Gibson pointed out, uh, but also to address the employment issues that Representative Pope uh, pointed out, where an agency head does not want to provide any more information than a former employee's start date and end date to risk uh, only to risk defamation liability. So either a statewide database or at a minimum a good faith exception for defamation liability could help that situation. I'd like to turn now to training. When I went through a police academy in Florida almost 20 years ago, the state required me to receive 672 hours of instruction. That was 2001. In 2014, Florida updated its requirements. If I was to go back to the academy today, I would have to complete 770 hours of training. That is still 70 hours, almost two weeks, below the national average. According to a Bureau of Justice Statistics report from 2013, the most recent year for which data are available, uh, training programs, basic training programs, not including field training, take on average 840 hours, or about 21 weeks. That was 2013. More recent data suggests that that number is up just a little bit in the area of 21 to 24 weeks. That's the national average. And right now, the basic recruit certification in South Carolina takes 480 hours. That is half of the national average, roughly. And even before the pandemic, a full third of the academy's curriculum, that is four weeks of its 12-week curriculum, were offered online only, academy-directed remote training, videos and workbooks that officers must complete on their own. Let us leave aside the current public health pandemic, which I understand requires a number of changes and modifications to business as usual. Putting that aside, I'm aware of no other academy in the country that had such a high percentage of its curriculum taught remotely. There is good reason for that. Pedagogical research on effective adult learning tells us that engaged interactive learning is essential. Some of the topics relegated to academy-directed remote learning today in South Carolina truly require extensive discussion. For example, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment rules that safeguard civil rights. I have personally seen well-intentioned, hard-working police officers testify in court about the rules that limit their authority, including when they can make entry into private residences and get clear legal rules wrong because they weren't well educated on these issues. To be clear, police training in South Carolina is not well regarded outside of the Palmetto State. Maria Haberfeld, a former sergeant in the Israeli Defense Forces, a lieutenant in the Israeli National Police, is now a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, one of the preeminent criminal justice uh, institutions in the country. She's studied and written about police training for the better part of two decades, and in 2017 she said, and I quote, South Carolina has one of the worst academies in the country. They are an embarrassment to the police profession and a danger to society. I have the privilege of being one of have a handful of academics invited to participate in an ongoing national symposium on police training. 
at our inaugural meeting in Washington, D.C., police chiefs and academy directors from around the country were not favorably impressed by our 400-hour, 480-hour uh, training requirement here in South Carolina. And for context, that is 20 hours less than your nail technician would need to get their state license. And it is less than a third of what your cosmetologist or beautician would need to get their state license. There are other states that are in a similar position, or in the case of Louisiana, bless their hearts, even worse. But we are in a position to do something here. We cannot blame the instructors at the academy. They are trying to do their best with limited resources, limited time, and often limited exposure to evidence-based adult learning pedagogies. The fault lies with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Training Council, with, which sets the minimum certification standards, and, frankly, with the legislature which funds the academy. A significant amount of academy funding comes from fines and fees. That revenue source is shrinking and has been shrinking. The 10-year period from 2008 to 2017 saw a 27% decrease in fines and fees funding to the academy, from $9.2 million to $6.7 million. The restrained enforcement during today's COVID epidemic will not help. If the legislature is serious about protecting the safety of officers, if you are serious about protecting the civil rights of community members, adequate funding for police training must be a priority. In addition to adequate funding, the state can increase training capacity. Even with the academy's dangerously abbreviated eight-week schedule of in-person training, there's a backlog. The state could both expand minimum training requirements and expand training capacity by authorizing additional academy locations. This is not new, certainly not in the country, and even not new in South Carolina. In the early 2000s, Governor Mark Sanford created six regional training centers to increase access to police training, a lack of resources and institutional commitment doomed to those efforts. That leaves South Carolina, the 23rd most populous state in the country, as one of only a few states that has a single statewide academy. For reference, there are 650 plus academies in the country, an average of about 13 per state. We are in line with uh, South Dakota and Washington, and I believe one other state has a single academy. Training will not solve all of the problems of policing. But it is a critical component of solving at least some of the problems with policing. It is critical for officers to be trained. And right now, that is not always the case. The state allows an officer to serve for up to a year without earning a certification. The legislature should amend provision section 23-23-40 that permits uncertified officers to exercise the full panoply of police powers so long as they complete a firearms training course. That qualification course, by the way, you can find it in Exhibit 5. It's pretty limited. It requires officers to shoot 50 bullets from uh, uh, several different ranges. That's, that's it. And even that limited requirement is waived if the firearms qualification course isn't available within three days of an uncertified officer's beginning employment. Undertrained and untrained officers are a liability, not an asset. They endanger the public, other officers, and themselves. At a bare minimum, the state should limit the duties of uncertified and untrained officers, allowing them to work only under the direct in-person supervision of certified officers and require actual training, not just a qualifications course, in tactics, firearms, and the use of force. I'd like to switch to decertification. It's often said within policing that there is nothing a good cop hates more than a bad cop, and there is good reason for that. When officers are unnecessarily rude, when they violate civil rights, when they use excessive force, they engage in the kind of policing that gives officers, not just at their agency, but across the country, a bad name. But the problem is actually more insidious than that. Researchers have shown, using something called social network analysis, that misconduct is contagious. Distinguished criminologist Samuel Walker has said that officers who are inclined to engage in misconduct are, quote, like magnets, end quote, drawing toward each other and reinforcing problematic behaviors. Worse, studies have found that officers who aren't prone to misconduct can become prone to misconduct by working around problem officers. I will point you to Exhibit 6. Firing officers may move the problem. It does not solve the problem. Officers who get fired 
or who resign in lieu of termination from one agency will very often get a job at another agency, what are called wandering officers or, as the solicitor mentioned, gypsy cops. According to a study published earlier this year, Officers typically move from larger agencies to smaller agencies with fewer resources, more manpower constraints, and uh, less selectivity with their officer candidates. That same study found that wandering officers are significantly more likely than other officers to engage in future misconduct. Addressing the problem of wandering officers requires a strong statewide decertification regime. The good news is South Carolina is one of the 44 states that has a statewide decertification regime. The bad news is that ours is not particularly strong. A study of officers in Florida found that 3% of all of the officers in the state were gypsy cops. They had previously been fired from or resigned in lieu of termination from a prior agency. Florida has a very active decertification regime. They've decertified more than 8,300 officers. South Carolina, well, we haven't decertified that percentage, even per capita. So you can imagine how much worse it might be here. Our decertification statutes and regulations should be amended. Here's a few reasons why. If an agency begins investigating alleged misconduct and then the officer resigns, most agencies stop investigating. And it makes sense for them to do so. When an agency is doing an internal investigation, they are determining whether an employee should be disciplined or trained or terminated, for example. They don't have any of those problems or any of those incentives if it's a former employee. There are some agencies that will continue an investigation until con conclusion, but the majority terminate the investigation when an employee terminates their employment. But when an agency stops an investigation, the behavior may not get reported to the academy at all, even if it would otherwise qualify for reporting. State law requires reporting, quote, within 15 days of the final agency or department action resulting from an internal investigation, end quote. When there is no completed investigation, there is no final agency action, and thus there is no report. Some agencies, as I mentioned, continue reporting, but if an officer resigns, it now adds an additional complication. In, when an officer separates their employment, the agency has only 30 days from the date of separation to complete its investigation and report to the academy. This is a statute of limitations. 30 days often isn't sufficient to investigate serious misconduct. The Law Enforcement Training Council, which hears these cases, has sometimes held that waiting for an outside agency like SLED to complete its investigation is an extenuating circumstance that will allow for a waiver of the 30-day period. But any delays to internal investigations are not extenuating. I will point you to Exhibit 7. When an incident is timely reported by an agency, the officer in question can request what's called a contested case hearing before the training council. The regulations state that the reporting agency, that is the agency that filed the report with the academy reporting an officer's alleged misconduct, sh quote, shall handle the prosecution of the claim. Putting this burden on the agency misunderstands the institutional incentives and competencies in play. First, agencies don't have any vested interest in the decertification process. As I mentioned, at the agency level, the goal is to deal with the problem officer. Once that problem officer is now a former employee, the agency's incentives have been satisfied. At best, they have a professional commitment, but professional commitments, well, you try and get agencies to spend money on what are mere professional commitments without legal requirements. Well, you have done that. It doesn't work very well. Why would an agency want to commit additional resources to a problem that they no longer have? Second, most agencies don't have the expertise to actually prosecute these claims. In South Carolina, unlike most states, various state rules of civil procedure, rules of evidence, and even rules of criminal procedure apply to the contested hearings. More than half of our police agencies in the state have less than 10 officers. Most of the remainder are pretty small. The large agencies, the Greenvilles, the Charlestons, the Richland Counties, the Columbia Police Departments, those are the exception not the rule. That means that most agencies do not have in-house counsel, nor can they afford to hire an attorney who is fully conversant with the rules of evidence and procedure, both civil and criminal, that they need to use in an academy process. As a result, we've created a perverse incentive for agencies, especially smaller agencies, to allow officers to resign 
without taking on all of the burdens of prosecuting that officer's certification. This means that an officer who engages in misconduct can resign and their malfeasance won't get reported to the academy, or the agency, even if it does report, won't necessarily prosecute the case. Or they might prosecute the case, but they won't necessarily do a very good job with it. You should not take my word for this. In September of 2019, SLED Chief Mark Keel expressed concerns about agencies failing to prosecute misconduct cases. I point you to Exhibit 8. According to an analysis of the Training Council minutes from last year, at least 12 agencies failed to prosecute at least 14 officers last year, including in cases involving allegations of dishonesty, of physical abuse, and unsafe practices involving firearms or vehicles. I will point you to Exhibit 9, which lists out those agencies, the officers involved, and quotes from the minutes of each one of those meetings so you can see the dispositions. Like other governmental employees or agents, individuals holding a state license, officers deserve the protections of due process. But the state needs to ensure that the procedures in place appropriately balance the public interest in weeding out officers who have engaged in misconduct. Here are a couple of ways that we could do that. First, we could do it by requiring agencies to complete investigations into certain types of misconduct, regardless of whether the employee separates or not. Second, we could eliminate the 30-day post, the post-separation statute of limitations. Third, we could either establish an Office of Independent Certification Council, or we could appoint Independent Certification Council to argue the issue instead of putting the burden of prosecution on the police agency. The agency should be no more than a fact witness. We might also revisit the substantive grounds for decertification, especially in light of how we compare to other states of our size and with neighboring states. Finally, here, as in other areas, we need additional transparency. Decertification records and the details of an officer's misconduct are not currently made public. Contrast that, our approach to police decertification, with the State Board of Education, which posts, as in Exhibit 10, 10 years of disciplinary records online. Each one of those disciplinary records is hyperlinked. You can click on them and get a case summary, see Exhibit 11, which, so that the public can see the specific reasons for disciplinary action taken by the State Board of Education. Or we could use these statistical summaries that Florida provides, see Exhibit 12, about all of it, what they call their probable cause hearing, what we would call our contested case hearings. Our lack of commitment to transparency is hurting our national reputation. Late last year, USA Today published decertification data pulled from the National Decertification Index which show that South Carolina has decertified a grand total of 15 officers. That is far below the per capita decertification rate of our closest neighbors, far below the absolute number of decertification rates in other states of about our size. It's also far below the actual number of decertifications in the state of South Carolina. Last year, the Academy decertified 30 officers. That's more than double the number in the decertification in 31 officers, I believe. That's more than double the number of decertifications reported in the National Decertification Index. Right now, the only way for people, not just out of the state, but in the state, to get a realistic picture of what we're doing with regard to police decertification is to file public records requests with the Academy and then sift through the data on their own. That's not happening. If you want to increase public trust in law enforcement, then the public needs to have a more accurate understanding of police decertification. And it is incumbent on the state to affirmatively make that information more available. We should be, for example, not just putting data out there, but reporting to the National Decertification Index. I'd like to talk briefly about body-worn cameras. I know this has already been addressed, but I want to add a few details. There are two problems with the body-worn camera regime as it's currently laid out that could benefit from legislative correction. First, as you know, the body, body camera mandate only applies when the legislature provides funding to agencies. Thus far, that mandate has not been fully funded. That means that the agencies around the state that have acquired body-worn cameras are either doing so at their own expense or uh, they don't have them yet. Second, the guidelines provided by the Law Enforcement Training Council are very limited. 
As someone who has written about police body-worn cameras and provided body camera-related training to more than 40 different audiences around the country, including the American Judges Association, the Conference of Chief Justices, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the command staff of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Explosives, multiple police agencies and organizations, I am well aware of the policy issues that make implementation of a body-worn camera system challenging. But the just over two pages of guidance offered by the Law Enforcement Training Council do not help agencies or communities deal with those issues. The existing guidelines recite some of the statutory language and provide a few minimum standards. But that is very little help to agencies that need to make a determination about a number of important issues, including, for example, whether officers should proactively make recording announcements, whether and how body camera footage should be used internally by officers or by supervisors, when and how video should be subject to discretionary release, how agencies can address privacy concerns, how to navigate discretionary or civilian requested camera deactivation, and so on. Some of these issues, such as a prohibition on deletion or manipulation of data, can be dealt with pretty easily as a matter of statute. Other issues, such as whether an officer should be able to watch their own body-worn camera footage prior to completing all reports, or only prior to completing incident reports but not use of force reports, may have a statutory answer, or may be left to agencies so long as agencies and communities are adequately informed about the benefits and drawbacks of the different approaches. To that end, you should consider legislation in this area as well as require more substantial guidance from the Law Enforcement Training Council. I'd like to shift to talk about use of force statutes. In the recently published book, Exhibit 13, my co-authors and I dedicate an entire chat. Thank you. Dedicate an entire yeah, shameless self-promotion. I apologize for that. My co-authors and I dedicate an entire chapter to the various ways that states regulate police uses of force. 42 states have statutes that govern the use of deadly force by police. South Carolina is not among them. 37 states have statutes that govern the use of less lethal force, with most identifying the circumstances under which officers can use force, as well as the amount of force that officers can use. South Carolina is not among them either. We are one of only eight states in the country that regulate police use of force purely through judicial decisions. And unfortunately, our judicial decisions aren't particularly illuminating. As someone who helped draft California's 2019 amendment to what was, at the time, the two oldest unamended use of force statutes in the country, I am well aware of the political challenges that amending or creating a state use of force statute can entail. But we are in a position to learn from and benefit from the experience of other states, to collaboratively set appropriate legal standards in a way that provides meaningful guidance while also protecting the physical well-being of officers and community members alike. In the interest of time, I will withhold specific commentary about the potential content of a use of force statute, including components like tactics and de-escalation until some other time. But I know that others, uh, I and others, are more than willing to be a, a resource. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, after-action investigations and what are called sentinel event reviews. When an officer is involved in a critical incident, such as a shooting or another action that results in serious injury or death to an officer or others, accountability requires some review. That review must ask the right questions, and it must also be conducted in a way that inspires public trust. I want to discuss each one of those things in turn. First, the after-action reviews have to ask the right questions. Generally speaking, the current approach focuses identifying whether the individual officer, one, violated agency policy, or two, violated state law that is committed a crime. Those are important questions. We need the answers to those questions. But they're not the only important questions. In the medical context, and in the airline industry, for example, a serious incident is reviewed uh, not just to determine whether the individual actions of the individual officer in that individual incident were appropriate, but also at the broader factors that may have contributed to the ultimate harm. This is referred to as sentinel event review. The goal with sentinel event review is not to discipline an individual officer. It is to improve the outcomes of future cases, to reduce the likelihood of future negative outcomes by identifying systemic factors that may have contributed to them. This is not entirely new to policing. New Orleans Police Department is right now creating a sentinel event review process, and uh, this is certainly something that's been picked up by some of the larger agencies around the country. Second, 
after action reviews and investigations have to be accurate. They also have to be perceived as legitimate. The best investigation in the world is not going to help with police community relations if it is not trusted. The public must trust that an investigator's goal is not to protect the officers, but instead to develop the most comprehensive understanding of events in a way that identifies and explains, to the extent that it is possible, any discrepancies between different pieces of evidence. Independent investigations can help, but the mere fact that an investigation is independent is not by itself enough. It must still be a good investigation. Right now, many agencies in the state turn to SLED, the State Law Enforcement Division, to conduct investigations. But some SLED investigations have been marked by troubling failures. When SLED investigated the shooting of Lori Jean Ellis, the investigator failed to question officers about critical inconsistencies between their statements and other pieces of evidence. That investigator later testified in deposition. He does not actually read forensic reports, and he decided that officers were telling the truth in their statements because they were officers. The investigator failed to canvass the area and failed to speak to neighbors, steps so basic that they've been referred to as part of Investigations 101. Disregarding or failing to address potential conflicts in the different sources of evidence is not the hallmark of a thorough investigation. The SLED investigation into the shooting of Ernest Russell failed to identify very obvious inconsistencies between the statements of the shooting officer and the video of the event. In fact, the ultimate investigative report omitted the video entirely, although it included a couple of still images from the video. Uh, but still images are really not a good way to evaluate a series of events. The SLED investigation into the shooting of Melvin Lawhorn either failed to identify that an officer's car had a dash camera in it, or uh, failed to document why video was not available. Either way, that's kind of a significant oversight. You need to know if that was a non-functional camera at the time, as opposed to trying to figure that out later. And according to one interview, SLED investigators routinely fail to examine officers' disciplinary history or other evidence to evaluate credibility and reliability. Maybe that state misconduct database could help with that. That's also a significant oversight. I realize this sounds like an attack on SLED. I really don't mean it to. I offer these examples because I happen to have them readily available. I want to demonstrate how investigative shortcomings can undermine public trust, not just in those particular investigations, but in the ultimate results of any investigation. When an, an agency's SLED or any other's investigative failures are documented the way that all of those and more were by, among other things, the Washington Post, it can be very difficult for community members around the state to trust the next investigation that the agency is doing. There are ways the legislature can address these issues. You could, for example, require or encourage and support Sentinel event review. You could provide for improvements to after-action investigations, including by developing an independent audit process to review investigations before they are finalized. Not entirely dissimilar to a conviction integrity unit. You could develop a dedicated entity that conducts such investigations, as has been done in other jurisdictions. Turning now to my penultimate point on officer wellness. From 2014 to 2019, an average of 54 officers were feloniously killed every year. About 48 officers were accidentally killed or succumbed to a work-related illness every year. And in the same time frame, on average, 179 officers took their own lives every year. Consider that for a moment. For every officer who was killed in the line of duty, more than three took their own lives. Law enforcement culture has a deep and abiding uh, regard for bravery, resilience, and strength. Officers are expected to keep it together, to take care of business, to do what they need to do. Policing is stressful, but struggling to deal with the stresses of the job is too often considered a sign of weakness, an inexcusable personal failure. As the International Association of Chiefs of Police concluded in a 2014 symposium, quote, in many departments, the culture toward mental wellness or addressing emotional problems of any kind is one of disdain and avoidance. Because of that, end quote, excuse me, because of that culture, officers may deny, even to themselves, that the stress they're under is getting to them in some ways, which has led to, unfortunately, a higher than average rate of alcohol use and abuse and domestic violence in policing. 
if they do recognize that they're having difficulties, officers, as the solicitor mentioned, may be very reluctant to share that information with peers and supervisors. Officers fear that admitting to struggling emotionally or psychologically will limit their opportunities for advancement or could even cost them their careers if they are deemed not fit for service. But an officer who is struggling with, mental, uh, with emotional well-being is no different than an officer who is struggling with a knee injury. They simply aren't in a position to do what they need to do to keep community members, other officers, and themselves safe. As the IACP put it again, quote, officer mental health is an issue of officer safety, and we should treat it as such, end quote. We have not treated it as such here in South Carolina. Our workers', our workers compensation statute, for example, states, and I quote, stress, mental in injuries, and mental illness arising out of and in the course of employment unaccompanied by physical injury, are not considered a personal injury, end quote, unless the employee can establish that they resulted from, quote, employment conditions that were extraordinary and unusual in comparison to the normal conditions of that particular employment, end quote. In the context of policing, they see some weird stuff. There's really nothing that can be considered, and again I quote, extraordinary and unusual given the scope of what officers see. And state courts have adopted basically that approach. It makes it all but impossible for officers' mental, in excuse me, for officers mental in injuries to be covered by workers' compensation. In the 2015-2016 legislative session, a bill that would have extended workers' compensation coverage to first responders, including officers, whose stress, mental injury, or mental illness resulted from their direct involvement in a traumatic experience or situation, died in committee. The legislature should revisit that proposal. The legislature should also help police agencies create a working environment where officers at all levels are encouraged to acknowledge and deal with the emotional challenges of policing. For example, again, as the solicitor mentioned, officer stress could be a regular part of annual physicals. It could also be part of officer evaluations. The legislature could create employment protections for officers who, in good faith, pull themselves out of service when they are struggling. Officers need to know that acknowledging emotional issues is not just professionally appropriate. It actually takes more bravery, resilience, and strength than denying or ignoring the underlying problems. The legislature can incentivize agencies to take these issues seriously, perhaps by exposing agencies to liability when they don't. A police culture that takes mental health seriously should have little tolerance for officers who, because of agency pressures, endanger themselves, other officers, or community members because of their refusal to acknowledge potential problems. The last thing I'd like to talk about is policing for profit. Safe and effective policing depends on public trust, period. This is not only well known to veteran officers, it's been confirmed over and over again in procedural justice research within criminology, law, public policy, psychology, and other disciplines. Unfortunately, some aspects of policing are incredibly destructive to public trust, and this includes using the police primarily or substantially as a method for revenue generation, particularly when there are limited, if any, benefits to public safety. In economics, this is referred to as rent-seeking, but it is more commonly referred to in the police context as policing for profit or sometimes cash register justice. When police are seen as going after money instead of contributing to public safety, it undermines respect for policing and for the rule of law. You may remember that in the Robin Hood stories, the corrupt sheriff of Nottingham was the bad guy. There was a reason for that. I don't want to talk anymore about civil asset forfeiture. I believe that's already been well addressed by prior speakers. I do want to talk about, well, I will mention one, one more thing uh, with civil asset forfeiture. Um, first, you may have seen the Greenville News article that found that uh, Police sees more than $17 million over three years here in South Carolina. You might also, if you read the fine print there, most of that doesn't come from large busts. More than half of, that, uh, of the seizures, more than half of the dollars are from seizures of less than $1,000. And of course, the forfeitures are not evenly distributed in society. Black men make up about 13% of the state's population and 65% of the individuals targeted for forfeiture. That discrepancy cannot be blamed on drug use rates or drug possession rates. Because we know from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration that drug use rates among whites and blacks are statistically a dead heat. They're within a margin of error of each other. 
Uh, also, for what it's worth, the Institute, of Ju Institute for Justice gave South Carolina civil asset forfeiture law a D-minus grade, which I guess is passing, but not one that I'd be real proud of in my classroom. The more uh, important aspect of policing for profit, well, not more important, the one that I want to focus more of my comments on relates to the use of city ordinances for traffic enforcement, particularly by the smaller cities in the state. And if you haven't if been exposed to it, it works like this. A city passes an ordinance that covers basically all traffic violations. When a driver is stopped for speeding or changing lanes improperly or whatever it is, the officer writes a ticket for something like thoughtless operation or whatever the local ordinance is titled instead of a ticket for the state speeding violation. Those city ordinance violations typically cost significantly more, often several hundred dollars, but they don't put points on the driver's license. So far as I'm aware, none of the cities that have adopted this ordinance have ever invited or attempted to study whether there are actually public safety benefits to this approach. The research is somewhat mixed on this. Um, there's reason to doubt that it does contribute significantly to public safety, particularly when the agency is set up on the interstate or on a large road, mostly pulling over folks who are not part of that community and just happen to be driving past. Avoiding the state's, the state's point system, the points that go on our license, undermines your efforts, legislative efforts, to identify and address drivers who have exhibited a pattern of dangerous behavior over time. Those points are how we for profit as quote commodifying for profit as, quote, commodifying and police and described it as and quote, quote a and described it as quote a recipe tensions. for police community to reduce those tensions the legislature should review both civil asset forfeiture and also the displacement of state traffic laws by municipal ordinances thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you about just a few of the pressing issues in policing there are many 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 others that we could discuss including dangerous vehicle pursuits police use of facial recognition technology recording of police interviews uh, pseudoscientific forensic evidence analysis the use of error prone eyewitness identification procedures or uh, uh, interrogation techniques but in the interests of time i'm not going to talk about any of those for which i expect your undying gratitude <laughs> To anticipate your first question, my last name is pronounced Stoughton, and I look forward to your questions and to working with anyone uh, committed to the continual improvement of policing. Anyone have questions for Professor Stoughton? Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stoughton, I was noticing looking over your uh, bio on the uh, University of website that you uh, spent, it looks like, maybe, uh, five years as full-time as a law enforcement officer. Was that in Tallahassee? It was, yes, sir. Okay. And, and then a year as a, uh, a part-time? Um, I spent just under five years as a full-time officer, stayed on for six months, I believe, as a reservist when I switched to uh, a position as a state investigator in the Florida Department of Education's Office of Inspector General for a little more than two and a half years. Okay, that was something I was going to ask you. It said that you also were a state inspector. Uh, so that was with the Inspector General's office? Yes, sir. And the, the Inspector General's office in, um, in the Department of Education was functionally okay. like the the internal affairs department Correct. for the for that agency yeah yeah so in in your years of experience with law enforcement uh, uh what would you say about uh, uh the the officers of themselves uh, you, uh i'm you, sorry you spoke a little bit about them in your presentation uh do you feel like that uh, uh most officers in most uh, law enforcement programs are those that uh, have integrity, those that uh, uh, seek to take and to be good community-oriented uh, uh, law enforcement programs? I, um, if, I, if I understand your question, Representative, um, I believe that most officers get into the profession for the right reason. Um, I believe that uh, most of them, as, as I did, will state in their oral board in the interview that they are getting into it because they see the opportunity and the need to help people. Um, I don't think that policing as an industry has always lived up to the ideals of its, of its newest members. And I think there are challenges, both historical and contemporary, that have made it very difficult to shift, to change an institution like policing. Part of what's made it very difficult is we have um, 
in the country, some 18,000 different police agencies. Just in South Carolina, there are some 300 or so different police agencies. And while you can have some uh, highly professional leaders that set a, an appropriate tone and that um, although they are not going to prevent the, the occasional problem officer, they're certainly going to build an environment that makes it difficult to become a problem officer. There are also some agencies that, that haven't set that tone, perhaps because they don't have the interest, but more often, I think, because they don't have the, the resources. Uh, it's very difficult to look at a 12-person a, a police agency and say that they have the institutional um, experience to create a, a, a strong system that has multiple layers of supervision when there might not be multiple layers of supervision. So I, I think it's very easy to be well-intentioned, but um, sometimes that those good intentions are also what, what pave a, a road that we don't want to go down. Sure. Does that well, answer your question, sir? It, 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 it did, and it, 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 you're, you're heading in the, the right direction, I think, to, uh, to take and continue that on, because one of the things that I have, have noticed over the years is that we can certainly make excuses for not having the resources and so forth available to take and to have the proper oversight and accountability and so forth. There are ways you can take and go about doing that and uh, addressing those issues. One of the things that uh, uh, I have noticed, I had a good conversation with, uh, uh, with uh, folks in law enforcement. Uh, both at the Police Chiefs Association or Sheriff's Association, for, and they have actually put together a lot of the recommendations that address some of the issues, a good portion, I would say not just some, but a good portion of issues that you have uh, uh, brought up. And it, it, uh, would, it would be very good for the rest of the committee to take and look at that and to, and to see that. One of the things that I have noticed over the years is that one of the keys to taking and, and being uh, able to take in to get to that point in time, and I'd like for you to to, uh, uh, to address that also, is is to do as much work as you possibly can on the front end. Uh, one of the things that I, I did when I first went to the city of Simpsonville was to take a look at uh, their policies and procedures on an overall basis and their, their, their overall employment and so forth, not just in law enforcement, but overall basis and put together a program that tried to connect the dots for the, uh, from the policies of the, uh, the council and so forth, but also to take and tie that into the budgeting process so that you had incentives there as well as uh, uh, deterrence and all there, but also to take as a part of that to develop a, a process where you try to focus and set priorities on quality uh, versus quantity, because one of the things I have noticed in law enforcement over the uh, number of years is that there is a tremendous push toward quali quantity and not so much for quality. And to try and change that focus and direct that toward it. One of the things I'm noticing from what's being recommended here is that they're trying to take and shift that focus to more of the quality issues in their recommendations uh, for law enforcement in the, in the, in the uh, going forward in the future. And one of the things I have found, and then like for you, since you have been in law enforcement as well as from the research standpoint of it, is that if you do a lot of that work up front, it gives you the ability to take and do a lot of the things that you're talking about we also take and need to take and do, which is the oversight in the accountability. <laughs> yes, sir. So would you mind you know, speaking to that a little bit also? Yes, yeah, absolutely, and thank you, Representative, uh, for, the, for the question. Um, I think one of the fundamental mistakes that we have historically made as a society about policing is to view problems as individual bad apple problems, right? To say, well, that's only the, the bad apple officer. Uh, and don't get me wrong, sometimes that is the case. But sometimes apples go bad because there's something wrong with the barrel that they're in, or there's something that we can do to the barrel to make it more difficult for those apples to go bad. And that's what I believe you're talking about with, with policy review, with the South Carolina Police Chiefs Association recommendations. Um, the uh, correcting some of what I believe are the quantity over quality problems, the approach of, of for example, let me, let me provide some more specific examples. I don't know if any agency in the state would uh, admit to using quotas, uh, but if you dive in, I'm confident that you will find that sometimes uh, supervisors make decisions or agency may, agencies make promotional decisions based on who is the most proactive officer, 
who's stopping the most people because we want him on our traffic unit, for example, or who's getting the most drugs because we want them off of patrol and into our vice narcotics, for example. Um, that's our fault in society. That's because the way that we have evaluated police agencies historically is to say, well, how is crime rate and what, are, uh, what is the effect on crime rates and what are the easily available numbers? How many guns have you pulled off the street? How many traffic stops have you made? How many arrests have you made? But those, that focus, which we the public have used to evaluate police agencies, is, has created perverse incentives. Now agencies say, we need proactivity, we need quantity, but not we need quality, right? We want to make sure, for example, I'm sure both of the solicitors behind me have had cases that they would have loved to prosecute, but can't because evidence was not seized correctly, right? That's a quality issue, not just a quantity issue. Um, I, I think as we think about police reform, we need to think about systems. State law is one of those systems. Agency policy is one of those systems. Training, both at the state level and at the agency level, is one of those systems that we can use to try and preserve the, the what I believe is the fundamentally beneficial uh, uh, effect of policing as it should be practiced. As a as an industry, just like as a country, we haven't always lived up to our ideals, but I think the only way that we're going to do that is by committing to these systemic reform efforts. Thank is that you. is that responsive? Mm -hmm. Yes, you. sir, that is. Thank you. Ms. Dillard. Your um, full body of work. Um, one of the things we talk about training, um, and your um, data was uh, very uh, enlightening. Now I feel safer with my nail tech than I do with a police officer. Um, but uh, one of the things that I have thought about and watching the riots and things on television most recently is that uh, many of our military uh, folks come home and they find jobs with our police department. And it is my hypothesis that it's two different jobs, and I worry about are we demilitarizing folks who come home who have been trained to protect and defend and to destroy if necessary, uh, rather than to protect and serve. And so I am wondering, is that transition being dealt with, or, is, or should it be something to be dealt with as we seek employment, because I've heard about hiring standards from the previous speaker, but I do worry about that and, and what I am, what I'm seeing. And, I, and I've had a family member who retired 25 oh. years in the military, but then came home to a small town uh, in Alabama and became part of their police force. And all was well, but I do worry about that. Is that something I should be worried about? Uh, Representative Dillard, thank you for that um, question. I, I wish I had a better answer than, than the one I'm about to give you. Uh, and I say this, it, my, my answer is not just as a, as a police officer, but also as the son of a Marine and the brother of an Air Force veteran. Um, we don't know. There are no good studies to determine whether officers with former military experience are uh, net positive, if they're better than the average officer or worse than the average officer or, or how. What I can give you are a lot of anecdotes, but the anecdotes point totally different directions. There are some anecdotes that I can give you of officers who very problematically bring the war home with them. But there are uh, an equal number, I would say, of anecdotes I'm aware of where an officer who has served overseas in combat says, why would I get upset and overreact to some 16-year-old mouthing off? I'm used to IEDs and RPGs coming at me, right? Like, this, this is nothing. This is a very easy transition. I think it's going to be very dependent on the individual, from what I can tell, and it's going to be dependent on the agency and what type of culture and system, to Representative Smith's point, the, the agency puts into place. If the agency fosters a highly adversarial, aggressive approach to policing, if they try to positively leverage, or let me phrase that differently, I mean positively in the sense of affirmatively leverage that officer's military experience and bring that part of the job to policing, I think that's deeply problematic. 
but I think that there have also been a number of military veterans who've served very honorably in the military and very honorably in, in the local policing context. Um, it is something that, uh, and I'm going to give you the caveat that as a professor, I think that everything deserves more study. It is something that I think deserves more, more study. Uh, and certainly one of the things the legislature might consider is um, funding, uh, as it had. In the 1970s, the legislature created the College of Police Sciences. Um, we call it College of Criminal Justice. Uh, and to, to help conduct research that would improve the police profession. Um, I think that might be, uh, uh, that would certainly be a, a topic worthy of study, uh, the, the effect of military service, if any, on policing, where we could actually quantify some of those effects as opposed to just having sort of mixed anecdotes. Mr. Thigpen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have great appreciation for the presentation that you just uh, offered us. Definitely, you have Thank proved you. that you are a researcher. Um, with that, I know oftentimes we do studies. I know that the climate may not uh, permit us to do the type of study and produce the type of research and evidence that you kind of outlined just because of, you know, the immediate nature of, I think, desired results. But with that being said, I really want to focus in on the ideal of independent or impartial or objective. Uh, when we talk about, I know you talked about the use of lethal force, uh, but then there's also just the use of force, whether you escalate or de-escalate. There's also the issue of policy versus law, uh, whereas policy is something typically the agencies tend to set, whereas law is something, of course, by statute. Uh, do you believe that independence is both necessita necessitated at violations of the law as well as violations of policy? That's, that's a very good question, um, uh, Representative. Um, and I, I will tell, I'm really not harping my book, or I'm really not trying to, but I will tell you that one of the big motivations for the book was um, our observation, my co-authors uh, and my observation, that um, many people, commentators, including lawyers, were not properly understanding the distinction between, say, constitutional law, state law, and agency policy, right? Um, I tend to think of policing as something that because it is so hyper-localized, I'm very skeptical of a one-size-fits-all solution. There may be communities that have a very high degree of trust, both now and historically, with their agency. And with that agency, I'm not sure there is a tremendous amount of benefit to an independent investigation for either violations of policy or of law. At the same time, we could imagine another agency down the road that has a long history of conflict with its community. And for that agency, uh, even what would maybe be considered lower level investigations, like um, discourtesy or use of force not resulting in serious injury or death, might benefit from an independent impartial investigation, not just a, a review of law, but a, a review of policy. I think it's very much going to depend on the, the position the agency is in. If I were to speak generally, if I were to try and craft a, a one-size-fits-all rule, uh, I generally think of policy as something that is internal to the agency. And if it's purely internal to the agency, then I tend not to have any issues with that being handled internally, assuming the agency has the capabilities and willingness to do that. Once there are problems with that, I think kind of all bets are off. Well, you kind of springboard to my second question, because the question, and I've wrestled with this, the question is about standardization. You know, I, I know we talk about legislatively what we can do, but really when you have so many different, of course, uh, locations with different challenges, with different uh, manpower, uh, with different just environments, should there be a certain level of standardization with policy and do all, I think I know the answer to that question, but do all or most agencies have the ability to internally craft their policies in such a way there, where there's some uniformity? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, yes, there should be certain minimum standards across agencies. Uh, and there already are minimum standards, or at least there should be minimum standards. Um, we might recognize them as, for example, the constitutional standard from deadly force uh, or the constitutional standard that governs deadly force with Tennessee v. Garner. If an agency doesn't have at least that, there's a real problem, if that makes sense. 
I think there is ample room for the legislature to develop or to uh, either suggest or require the Law Enforcement Training Council to develop certain other minimum standards. Um, we could very briefly go over uh, uh, tactical standards. We could go over vehicle pursuit standards. We could go over uh, interrogation tactics or, or technique standards. So yes, I think there is room for individual standards. Or excuse me, I think there's room for, for universal standards, right. minimum standards. I don't think that most agencies have a problem adopting a clear standard into policy. Where I think many agencies, particularly smaller agencies, struggle is developing their own standard well, in the, or their own policy in the absence of a standard. What tends to happen now is one of three things. Um, one, the agency just looks to some other agency and pulls their policy book and copies and pastes that into their own policy book. The problem with that is not every agency is in the same position. What works well in LA is not necessarily going to work well in Bluffton, right? Um, the next thing that some agencies do is they just purchase policy manuals off the open market. There's a company called Lexapol that has a pretty significant degree of market saturation and providing off-the-shelf policy manuals to police agencies. I don't know what the market saturation in, in um, South Carolina is. I can tell you 95% of police agencies in California have Lexapol policies. The last one is the most difficult, and because it's the most difficult, it's also the one that agencies aren't always great about doing, and that's really developing internally the policies that they need, preferably with the feedback from relevant stakeholders, including the rank and file officers and community members, at least for those policies that touch on uh, uh, community member interactions. Um, that's well, an awfully tall well, order for a 10-person agency. La last one, I apologize for keeping you this long. Um, and it deals with, again, the independence and kind of piggybacks right off the conversation you just had, statements you just made. Uh, when we talk about data collection and, and the importance of evidence base, which I, I you know, coming from a kind of scientific background, uh, I can have a great appreciation for being led and informed and educated in what we determine to do. With that being said, should the data collection be independent? I know, of course, the reporting of it has to be done by the agencies themselves, but should that be, do you think it would be more beneficial for that to be centrally housed in law enforcement or some independent source that would give oversight? Um, I don't, that's a stumper. Uh, that, that's a very good question. I would be a little reluctant to give any individual agency sort of pure custodial management of its data. I would want that reported centrally. I think whether that data gets reported to SLED or to the Attorney General's office or to the Academy, um, I, I think I could see reasonable arguments on all sides. Whoever it gets reported to should either have a, a, a transparency mandate where they are posting that data publicly or uh, have a transparency and also an analytic, uh, an analysis mandate where they have to review that data. So the issue is who it's the transparency and the reporting of it. I, I believe that's correct, Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you, Mr. Wooten. Um, I appreciate all the research. I'm, I'm gonna take a little bit of different approach here. I think I'm an old Marine military police officer. I'm an old trooper. Uh, here in South Carolina, 1992, I graduated the academy, uh, November uh, 20th, and that very night, my first night on the job, Trooper Mark Coates was on I-95, got in traffic stop, and got shot and killed the very first night on my job. So I realized this was not going to be all the the fun and games that I saw and thought that I. But I went from dealing policing Marines to, to policing the public, so there was also a big change there. What uh, since that point. Uh, in 1992, uh, over 5,000, I think, uh, police officers have been killed in line of duty or on duty. And that's the same number, ironically, that's been killed of Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq combined. And I don't know many people that know that, but right about the 5,000 number. So it's in, within a few. So we're truly fighting a war here at home just as we are uh, abroad. And that's the, I think that's the point that we need to take. 89 officers were killed in the line of duty last year, a nationwide, I think. Um, so, but, I, but I'm going to tell you, the, uh, if, if I'm wrong, you can correct my data. I'm, I'm, I'm a Google guy. I don't, yeah. um, so, um, 
But I'll, I'll, I'll just tell the panel this, and, and I'll address this. It, I don't know, I have no clue, and I think uh, Dr. Thigpen and I have talked about this before, I have no clue what it's like to be uh, a young black man stopped on the side of the road at midnight, and there's nobody within 30 minutes around to, uh, and you're scared. Black man, white man, whoever. But I do know what it's like to be that trooper that walks up on a car, and your nearest backup is 30 minutes away, and that car has tinted windows, and you don't know what's going to happen. But the two things that both of us have in common or we just both want to go home that night. So, and chances are, and you'll agree with this, I think, the chances are that uh, neither one of us have done anything even close to prohibiting that from happening. The chances are. Very, very, very sure. So, so my question is, our job as legislators, we can make more laws and we can legislate and we can change policy and, and the, the law enforcement uh, policy folks have, have reached out to us and given us a list of things that we need to change or working on changes, and that's coming. But I think it's all of our jobs uh, as a community that, you know, leadership in a church starts in the pews, and leadership starts in a business in the janitor's closet. So leadership starting in our community with culture change in this is what I'm, I would really like to be interested in and in seeing some of your data on what can we do as a culture to not only gain the respect of the police officers and, and, and uh, our law enforcement again, but why can we, you know, how can we build this? And I think you've probably seen some of this, obviously, in your, in your, with your background. But how do we do this? Um, you can't spell community without unity. So how do we unify the two and get that back? And, and I would be interested, and it doesn't have to be today. I could, you can share some data. But I'd just like to see how we can work collectively to, we, we've got to approach this from both ends. Yeah, the police, we've made some mistakes and we've done some things wrong, but our culture's done some of that too. So how do we fix that? And if you've got that answer, <laughs> you don't need us. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's the next book. Right, okay. Um, yeah, th thank you, Representative Wooten. Um, I, so first, uh, respectively, I disagree with your war analogy. I, I think that's a, a mistake. Um, in the 1970s, there were, on average, every year that decade, there were 115 officers feloniously killed in the line of duty. In the last 10 years, there's been uh, 51 officers feloniously killed in the line of duty every year. That's despite an increase, a rather significant increase, in the total number of officers from less than 300,000 to now more than 730,000 state and local officers in the, in the country. Policing has gotten significantly safer. Uh, and by the way, that, that numbers from the 1970s, that was a bit of a spike. But we also have a spike going back to the 1920s that's even greater than that. There are th at least three reasons for that. Um, we have better protective equipment. We, don't, we didn't have bulletproof vests in the 70s that we do now. Uh, better trauma care. And I just went back to 1992. I just went, yes, uh, since, since 1992, Iraq, Afghanistan. Yes. I, troops I, at home. So about the same. So that's, I, that was my point. Yes, sir. I, I, I can pull it out. I don't, I don't know the 1990s offhand. But what I can tell you is if you look at the trend, not just the per capita trend, but the total number trend, it has some waves, it has some bumps, but it is overall trending down. And that's not just true with officers killed in the line of duty. It's also true with officers assaulted. So it's not just that our trauma care is getting better and officers now have a higher chance of surviving what would have been a fatal injury 20 years ago. It's also that there are just fewer assaults, um, fewer assaults with knives, fewer assaults with guns, um, all of which I think are, are good things and, and we should celebrate. Uh, that's mirrored by a decline in, in violence in other aspects of society, right? There's been an overall decline in murder and, and the like. Um, I, I don't say that just to quibble. It's because I think that the, the war metaphor is a, is, a, is a problematic one for policing. And I think we are not doing our officers or our communities uh, a service when we pitch them as as soldiers fighting in the in the front lines as you've seen. Um, I I see your point about cultural change in the community and uh, and to use a very simple example, if no one resisted, officers would use a lot less force, right? Yeah, we've seen some examples of where officers use force and no one resisted, but let's leave those aside as the as particularly egregious. Um, I think it is difficult to regulate society compared to regulating an organized profession that's, that's uniformed and licensed by the state. Uh, 
I think there are things that can be done, including within law enforcement, to help change that community police dynamic. So one of the big things, and I apologize for using a buzzword, I don't like to typically. Professor Stone, if, if, if I could, yes, yes sir. I, and I, I've got a hard stop, and I, I do want to be able to, to get to a I'll, lot I'll of questions, and, and I would love that because part, part of what we're going to do, Professor Stone, is, is in moving forward is th the committee this size, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that we make up nearly 15 percent of the body in the House it is important because it allows the opportunity for us to break out in, into groups, to have working groups, and that allows uh, the, the very thoughts that you've given um, throughout your testimony uh, to be able to, to come to fruition so that we can work through the process of where we are. Hearing three hours of testimony, very important through this committee from, from differing viewpoints. And I think while that's important, the work of this, these subcommittees that we're getting to uh, momentarily for the members that have been uniquely chosen uh, from around South Carolina to tackle the issues that we face today and, and what are before us, because as I said in the opening remarks, at the end of the day, uh, the positive result that we want to come for this for all South Carolinians is vitally important for what we do in that policy. And uh, Solicitor Gibson mentioned, you know, those the three Ps, and uh, and we're going to tackle uh, exactly that. So, so for you, thank you, Professor Stoughton, thank for being you. here. We look forward to more testimony from you, actually. Um, for uh, Mr. Gibson, thank you for being here. Mr. Stone, uh, Professor Dennis, who joined us uh, earlier, uh, the testimony given, much appreciated by this uh, committee as we move forward. We couldn't do it without you. We appreciate your service. As we look forward to really where we go next uh, in this committee process will be uh, the formulation of those four uh, groups that I talked about. The first will be law enforcement, officer training, tactics, standard, and accountability, Mr. Wooten, uh, of which will serve on that committee, Mr. Wooten, uh, Dr. Thigpen, Ms. Dillard, Ms. Erickson. The next, civil asset forfeiture reform, uh, Mr. McKnight, Mr. Pope, Mr. Smith, and Mr. Wheeler, criminal statutory review, Ms. Bernstein, Mr. Gilliar, Mr. Hyde, Mr. Newton, sentencing reform is the final, uh, Mr. Hart, Ms. Kimmons, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Stavronakis. So those groups we hope to have um, in this environment of, of COVID-19 and what we face, uh, we come back in session September 15th under our signe die agreement. We hope to be able to have a report uh, from these four committees by then. That is a short period of time uh, and, and a lot to accomplish, but, but with the group that you see before you today, uh, that can certainly happen. So with that, uh, any further questions or additions? If not, we stand adjourned.